Ladies and gentlemen, before we proceed to our main agenda, let's pray together. And for Muslim participants, the prayer will be led by Bapak Muhammad Andri Maulana. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning and please be upon us all. Ladies and gentlemen, let's us bow our heads, hearts, and soul for a moment and pray to Allah for blessing is and success for our activities this morning. The International Conference on Climate Change, Agriculture, Biodiversity, and Environment, CABE 20 and 24. Let us pray according to our respective religions and belief, and please allow us to lead the prayer in the Islamic method. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Hamdan Shakirin. Hamdan Na'imin. Hamdan yuafi ni'amahu wa yukafi mazida. Ya Rabbana laka alhamdu kama yanbagi li jalali wa sikal karimi wa azimi sultanik. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammad. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the world. The most gracious, the most merciful, master of the day of judgment. It is you we worship, and upon you we call for help. Guide us to the straight path. O Allah, we praise and glorify you. We are today for the International Conference on Climate Change, Agriculture, Biodiversity, and Environment, CABE 20 and 24, seeking your guidance and blessings. We ask for your help and your forgiveness. We believe in you and trust you. We turn to you in repentance. Allah, make this webinar success. Bless the speakers, participants, and organizer of this conference with knowledge, compassion, and sincerity on their effort. May their discussion and deliberation be guided by your light. Oh Allah, give us the wisdom to make the right choices for our planet and our future. Oh Allah, bless this meeting with your blessing and goodness from the beginning to the end. Best for your mercy, favor, and grace upon us all. Forgive us our sins and grant all our requests. We ask all of this in your name. You are the most forgiving, the most merciful. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa bil akhirati hasana tawakina adhaban nao. Subhan rabbika rabbil aizzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala mursalin. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Amin. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Bapak Muhammad Andri Maulana. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I would like to invite the Head of Research and Community Service Center of Universitas Borneo Tarakan, Dr. Eti Wahyuni, to deliver an opening speech this morning. Time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yang terhormat para undangan, pembicara, peserta seminar, dan seluruh elemen yang hadir dalam acara ini. Izinkan saya mewakili Bapak Rektor Universitas Borneo Tarakan untuk memberikan sambutan sekaligus membuka acara pada hari ini. Selamat datang dan terima kasih kami ucapkan atas kehadiran pada seminar internasional dengan tema Harmoni Ekologi 2024. Suatu kehormatan bagi kami untuk berada di hadapan para pemikir, praktisi, dan pemimpin di bidang lingkungan. Guna bersama-sama menjelajahi langkah-langkah strategis dalam membangun ketahanan terhadap perubahan iklim karena keanekaragaman hayati dan lingkungan. Dalam era dinamika global yang kita hadapi saat ini, tantangan ekologis menjadi semakin kompleks. Perubahan iklim telah membawa dampak yang signifikan terhadap kehidupan di planet ini. Sementara keanekaragaman hayati terus terancam oleh berbagai tekanan antropok ini. Oleh karena itu, tujuan seminar kita hari ini bukan hanya untuk mendiskusikan masalah, tetapi juga menciptakan ruang di mana ide dan solusi dapat bersinergi, menciptakan fondasi bagi tindakan yang berkelanjutan. Tema membangun ketahanan terhadap perubahan iklim, keanekaragaman hayati, dan lingkungan mencerminkan kebutuhan mendesak untuk merangkul harmoni ekologi dalam setiap aspek kehidupan kita. 
Kita berharap melalui presentasi dan diskusi yang akan kita hadapi akan muncul wawasan baru, pemahaman yang lebih mendalam, dan keterlibatan aktif dalam mencari solusi. Setiap penelitian yang akan dipresentasikan hari ini adalah langkah konkret menuju pemahaman yang lebih baik tentang tantangan ini. Mulai dari identifikasi mikroplastik hingga studi makro debris di pantai, setiap temuan akan memiliki arti penting dalam memahami kompleksitas interaksi antara manusia dan lingkungan. Seminar ini adalah ajang kolaborasi lintas batas dan disiplin, di mana kekayaan pengalaman dan pengetahuan dari berbagai budaya dan negara dapat bersatu. Kami mengajak Anda semua untuk terlibat aktif dalam diskusi, berbagi pandangan, merumuskan solusi-solusi inovatif yang akan bawa kita menuju masa depan yang lebih berkelanjutan. Dengan mengucapkan Bismillahirrahmanirrahim International Conference Climate Change, Agriculture, Biodiversity and Environment 2024, kami nyatakan dibuka. Semoga acara ini menjadi wahana yang memberikan inspirasi, pengetahuan, dan semangat aksi bagi kita semua. Terima kasih atas perhatian dan kerjasama Anda. Selamat pagi. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Eti Wahyuni, and congratulations for the Research and Community Service Center of Unitas Bonitarakan for making this event succeed. Well, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to stay with us here because at the end of this seminar, we will share the e-certificate link in the chat room so you can receive the certificate through your email right away. Well, that is the whole series of opening ceremony of our international seminar today. As for the main agenda, which is the presentations by all the six speakers, we will be led by Dr. Wara Kusmaryani as our moderator today. Without further ado, to Dr. Woro Kusmaryani, time is yours. Okay, thank you, Azlina. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The Honorable Rector Universitas Borneo Tarakan, the Honorable Head of Research Center and Community Services Universitas Borneo Tarakan, the Honorable keynote speakers and presenters, and the Honorable all the committee and all the participants in this international conference. Welcome to International Conference on Climate Change, Agriculture, Biodiversity, and Environmental Study, CABE 2024, with the theme Ecological Harmony 2024, Building Resilience to Climate Change, Biodiversity, and the Environment. I'm Warokus Mariani, and it gives me a, a great pleasure to be the moderator today. Ladies and gentlemen, for our first session, we will have three keynote speakers. The first one, Dr. Ratno Ahyani. The second one, Arjun Turnip, PhD. And uh, the third one, Professor Dr. Insinyur Dodik Rido Nurahmat, MSC Aftrop. And the time allocation for each presenter uh, is about 30 minutes to present the papers. And after that, we will have question and answer session for about 15 minutes. And we will continue with three keynote speakers as well for second session with keynote speaker four, Associate Professor Jose Yamauchi, PhD. Keynote speaker five with uh, Christopher P. A. Bennett and the last speaker, Rasis Putra Ritonga, PhD. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, now allow me to welcome Dr. Ratno Ahyani to present his paper. But before Dr. Ratno Ahyani present, uh, let me read uh, his CV first. Dr. Ratno Ahyani, SPEMSE. He was born in Balikpapan, 29 July 1981. Educational background, bachelor degree on aquatic resources management at Universitas Mulawarman graduated 20, uh, 2005 with research focus on extraction study of chloramphenicol content in stream, and then magister degree on marine science at Institute Pertanian Bogor, graduated 2011 with research focus on characteristic of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, RPA 
age in water and sediment and its accumulation in the body of nome fish in Tarakan waters. And then doctoral degree on marine science at Institute Pertanian Bogor, graduated 2021 with research focus on bioaccumulation of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAH, and its influence on fish resources in the coastal waters of Tarakan City, North Kalimantan Province. And his expertise on environmental status. Currently, he is the head of the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs Research Center and Community Services Universitas Borneo Tarakan. His latest book publication, the first one, Characteristic Polycyclic Aromatic Hydrocarbon dan Bioakumulasi Hydrocarbon Aromatic Polycyclic PHAS pada sumber daya ikan, kajian empiris pada sumber daya ikan di Kota Tarakan, Provinsi Kalimantan Utara, and Biodiversitas Ekologi Biota Perairan, and then his latest publication, the first one, Type and Potential Sources of Polycyclic Aromatic Hydrocarbons uh, in Coastal Area of Tarakan City, North Borneo, Indonesia, uh, Indonesian Journal of Marine Sciences, 2021, And then the histological existence and evolution of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in milk fish, canos uh, canos mm -hmm. and hard uh, metric uh, SPP in the coastal waters of Tarakan City, North Kalimantan, Indonesia, 2021. And the last uh, publication characteristic of the distribution polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon uh, con contaminants yeah, in coastal waters, Tarakan City, North Kalimantan, Indonesia. Uh, IOP Conference Series, Earth and Environmental Science. And now, Dr. Ratno Ahyani will present the material about revealing the, the impact of microplastic and macro debris on terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem, a case study of the Kayan Sembakung Delta, North Kalimantan. Pak Dr. Ratno Ahyani, can we start? Thank you, Dr. Woro. Uh, dear guests, speakers, minor participants, and all attendants, uh, can hear my voice, Mr. Woro? Yes. Okay. Uh, dear guys, speaker and all participant and seminar and all attendance, uh, I will say assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Today, uh, we will we will present some of our research finding under the title of revealing the impact of microplastic and macro debris on terrestrial and aquatic uh, ecosystem. In case study of the Kayan Subakung Delta North Kalimantan. Uh, my presentation, Mr. Kiki. Just one moment, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, next, please. So this is uh, our outline uh, of the key points we will cover in our presentation today. And then uh, I hope we'll make a better data for us about the microplastic and macro in 
Kain Sebakung Delta, not Kalimantan. Next, please. Next. So the presence of microplastic in the environment is very crucial to understand the for various reasons that can influence ecosystem and human health. But this includes the presence of microplastic, of course, in the Kayan Sebakung Delta, which is hold the significant importance in both environments and the human context, of course, in impact to local biota, uh, expose health risk for human and effective aquatic ecosystem and has social economic implication. The impact for local biota, where the microplastic can enter the aquatic and terrestrial biota system, especially in fish and stream inhibiting uh, the Cayenne Sebakung Delta. This is can affect the health and sustainability of the local biota population. When we talk about human health risk, if microplastic are present in biota, that are part of them can be put by uh, food chains. There is a uh, potential health risk for human consumption. Then uh, influence for aquatic ecosystem, well, the microplastic can disrupt aquatic ecosystem, disrupt the ecological, ecological balance and impact nutrient cycles. This can be affecting, uh, this can affect by the reproduction, growing and the survival of the aquatic organism. In social economic impact, if microplastic contaminant in fish resource, in especially in kain sebakung, it can be uh, negatively impact for fishermen and the local community depend on the catch and sustainability of aquatic ecosystem. Next. So the this is the overview of the kain sebakung delta. Next. The uh, the landscape of the Kayan Sebakung Delta is exceptionally is, is unique, featuring two ecosystems, peat and mangrove. There is a safe a left hook source for the local community spanning across the several regions in the North Kalimantan province, and the delta established a social, cultural, economic interconnection among the residents. The role of the Kayan Sebaku Delta in economics is, of course, about the left foot source when the Kayan Sebaku Delta is play a crucial role of left foot uh, for the local community. Activities such as uh, fishing, agriculture, and uh, other natural resource base can uh, support by economic sustainability of the local community. In the social culture, the interconnection of social culture and economic aspect within the delta create a robust network among the population. The traditional practice and the local wisdom of uh, are often pre preserved and continue to enforce over time. And access to biodiversity, the delta provide the access to rich biodiversity, including the fisheries, aquatic plants, directly impact food security and the uh, local economic sustainability. So the implication of the presence of the micro and macro plastic in the Kain uh, Sebakung Delta, first maybe we can talk about the potential pollution due to the human activity. So the human activity in the Delta, such as everyday use of plastic, fishing, and agriculture, may contribute the presence of microplastic and macroplastic. Truly management, waste disposal, pose a risk of pollution. And impact for the aquatic system, the presence can be negatively uh, impact the aquatic system in the Delta. Organic system living in the water, including fishing and other aquatic biota may be exposed and uh, affected by the health impact of plastic. Then threat to uh, local economy, the plastic pollution can be harm the fisheries and agriculture sector, reducing the quality of uh, marine and agriculture product. This process a uh, threat to the livelihood and the food security of the local community. Next. So we talk about the microplastic hidden threat in the aquatic ecosystem. Next. 
definition about the microplastic and macroplastic first we talk about the macroplastic is a small plastic fragment measuring less than five millimeter the partic uh, this particle particles can be originated from the main source yes about the primary uh, micro then secondary microplastic primary is from a small particle when the initial the plastic product break down to uh, into smaller size due the mechanical or mechanical damage or degradation then second microplastic is from throughout the future degradation process of larger plastic such as a uh, plastic bottle bags and container which is uh, due to the exposure to sunlight, high temperatures, and other factors. There is a source of microplastic like uh, beauty and personal care product like facial scrub and toothpaste from textile like clothing, uh, industry like uh, plastic pallet from uh, manufacturing process, and then the larger plastic waste from degradation of larger plastic into microplastic. And the uh, Next is uh, marine debris, where the plastic was uh, entering the water environment and undergoing to the gradation. Next, uh, maracol plastic are the plastic fragment measuring larger than uh, five millimeter and can be found in various form, including larger pieces, bottle, plastic bags, and other plastic item. Uh, source can be uh, land-based waters. Sorry, uh, source can be a uh, land based wise, uh, direct disposal of plastic item into the terrestrial environment, such as a uh, plastic bags, bottle, and container, can be from marine debris, which is a uh, plastic waste is transported by river or wind into the sea, from industry, residues from manufacturing and construction process, from the transportation, like plastic fragment from vehicle tires or other automotive parts and agriculture use plastic in aqua uh, use of plastic in agriculture such as plastic mulch next so this is the uh, little microplastic cycle then when the refer to the journey of the transformation of microplastic in the environment involving a uh, various physical uh, chemical and biological uh, process uh, this cycle includes state of production distribution use degradation and its potential impact on the environment and human health from the illustration it's become crucial to understand the presence of the microplastic especially in the cayenne sembakung delta next to address this, we conduct the series of water, sediment, and biota sampling at various locations, particularly in uh, Tarakan City and the Cayenne River. Here is the methodology. This is the methodology we employ it to sustain the presence of the microplastic. Next. So the result is we, we can... Uh, give you uh, information the presence of microplastic in make waste uh, and tiger prawn in biota uh, in traditional pond in Tarakan City. Next, we conduct research in traditional fish pond sampling in uh, five locations like Jawa Permai in near resident areas a river uh, sampling location two and three in Belakang Bandara Islamic Center. There is a blood clot uh, resident area and river surrounded by uh, rivers are surrounded many uh, mangrove trees in there. The sample collection including the water and the biota, especially in milk, milk fish and tiger prawns. The study, the organ we study is from the digestive tracts of fish and prawn. Next. So the this is the result based on the variant on number of microplastic, especially in ponds water. In Juata Permai had a lowest amount of microplastic with its one point microplastic per liter. Mamburungan had the highest amount. 
the different uh, between the different between location in belakang bandara Tingguyun Islamic Center and Mamburungan had varying amount of microplastic indicating the different in microplastic pollution level in this area uh, we talk the level the high level of microplastic in Mamburungan actually may indicate the influence of the human activity in surrounding area such as industrial or house or place next and from for uh, from of microplastic in the uh, ponds of water is dominance of microplastic from fiber in Juwata Permai and then uh, belakang bandara Tengguyun and Mamburungan film and fragment also contribute uh, significant in some location there is a variation of microplastic from between research location indicating the different of pollution source and environment uh, characteristic. <coughs> when we talk about the dominance of fiber, is almost all locations against the microplastic fiber may be originated from a common source in regions such as uh, degradative uh, plastic waste. When we talk about Film and fragment, the significant contribution in this uh, form is some location may be indicate the influence of human activity and personal uh, breakdown of larger plastic in those waters. And when then talk about uh, filaments are present only in Islamic center is very low quantities, because indicating the variant Variation in the types of microplastic possibility uh, possible uh, due to the different source of the pollution pattern of the collocation and the the high quantity of microplastic, especially in form of fiber, is some location may be indicated potential microplastic pollution in this water. Next. We talk about the color of microplastic. The dominant of microplastic in color is black, and then uh, black is dominant in uh, location Bandara, Tengguyun, Islamic Center, and Maburungan, uh, such as uh, brown and blue, as uh, quite dominant in Tengguyun and Maburungan. This variation in microplastic color between research location indicating the difference. Uh, of, uh, different in pollution source and the influence of human activity. So the important uh, of idiom, identifying a pollution source is in microplastic color can be help identifying, uh, identify a pollution source and design more effective waste management strategies. Next. We talk about the, about uh, microplastic in trim especially of the size of microplastic. From three area, we have taken the sample Juwata Permai Slime Center and Belakang Bundara. This show the microplastic size 100 to 500 micrometer has the highest quantity in the Juwata Permai. In the Silk Center, uh, microplastic size 1,000 to 5,000 micro, micrometer uh, has the highest quantity and the belakang bandara uh, micro size uh, 500 to 100 to 500 micro has the highest quantity so this this show us the microplastic dominance occur the size of 100 to 500 in Juwata Permai dan belakang bandara and the size range from 1,000 to 5,000 micrometers dominance and uh, Islamic center. Next. Do the microplastic form, we indicate uh, fibers is dominant in Juwata Permai and then uh, Islamic center and belakang bandara film. We added identification but high slow quantity in our location Fragment uh, dominant in three Juwata and Islamic Center and Belakang Bandara of, of uh, also filament has limited contribution only in uh, Islamic Center and Belakang Bandara. 
So in-stream dominance is observed in fiber and fragment. Next. Uh, dominant uh, color is black dominance to all uh, apa, uh, dominant to a location red and blue have significant contribution in several like question and then when we see the other color have lower contribution in stream the dominant microplastic color is black at all resource location next and from the MIGWIS, uh, we identified the microplastic size 100 to 500, the highest quantity in Juata Permai. So, and then in Islamic Center, uh, more than 5,000 micrometer has the highest quantity. And then the belakang bandara, uh, microplastic size is more than 500,000. Uh, sorry, 5,000 micrometers has the highest quantity. Uh, in MIGWIS, uh, microplastic dominance called the size range. Uh, after, uh, sorry, is hampir sama dengan semua uh, lokasi. Uh, next, the dominance from the... Next, please. Okay. the dominance of the microplastic form we can see there is uh four form we can identify it. fiber film fragment and filament fiber is dominant in juata kerikil kemudian uh film dominance in juata permai uh, and fragment dominance in juata permai also so this uh, location is very dominant for all uh, microplastic form. Next. Uh, for the microplastic color in the uh, midfish, black, brown, and transparent is also quite dominant in Juata Permai. Uh, but brown and transparent have significant contribution in several locations. So we, when we talk about this uh, both biota, black seem to be uh, the most commonly found in microplastic color. This dominant color can be uh, focused on plastic waste mitigation and management effort, maybe to reduce the negative impact of marine life and aquatic system. Next. What time I what times I have? Because next uh result of our characteristic on microplastic in water of river in Tarakan City, there is this research can conduct for over five months in April to August. 2022, sampling was carried out by uh, five river location in Talakan City, including Station 1 in Mamburang River, Station 2 in Pasar Batu River, Station C in Jibatan Bongkok River, Station 4 from Sebangkok River, and Station 5 in Bandara River. The sample collects were uh, water. Next. So based on the data, the quantity of microplastic in river water in five uh, station, we reverse the variation in microplastic quantity. The station four has the quantity of microplastic, and while well, the station two has the lowest quantity of microplastic. The difference in the quantity of microplastic between station may be uh, 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 influenced by factors such as uh, human activity around the river, waterfall uh, water flow patterns and geographic characteristic when we talk about the source of microplastic the increase of quantity of microplastic may be related into human activity such as industrial domestic waste and construction activity around the river for the analysis need to be need to identify specific source for microplastic pollution and station this may including measuring the types of microplastic and their origins. So 
when we talk about the water flow pattern and river topography, it can also affect the distribution of microplastic along the river stationed closer to potential source of pollution, maybe have higher quantity of the microplastic. Next. Uh, the the dominance of microplastic form in the river Arakan is a uh, fiber in dominance are research station. Film, sig uh, film form is significantly contributes in our station. Filament also dominates and fragment have the biggest quantity in station one and lower quantity at other station. Uh, dominant of the fiber is from the microplastic form at all species station, uh, maybe can tell us the primary source of fiber is lacking textile was uh, the source of fiber is likely uh, from textile, maybe waste and degradation plastic fiber. Uh, the contribution of filament filament is make significant contribution indicating the presence of the pollution source possibility related to larger plastic waste on potential plastic degradation in the world, in the environment and uh, when we talk about the variation in quantity of microplastic between station indicating the difference of uh, pollution source and development characteristic at each station. Next, best. On the data of uh, quantity of microplastic, especially on uh, um, uh, microplastic sets, we can see the microplastic sets ranging from 100 to 500 micrometer domain, dominate in our research station and with the higher station at uh, station four. Microplastic sets uh, 1000 to 1,000 to 500 micrometer also have a significant uh, contribution, especially at station four. The medium size microplastic, uh, 100 to 500 micrometers dominant, indicating the significant presence of the medium size microplastic in the water. The high quantity of microplastic, especially in the medium size range, may indicate uh, a significant source of microplastic pollution in the are uh, in the research area. There are such range where no microplastic are present, such as uh, twenty to forty micrometer and forty to 60, 60 micrometer at the Stamlock station. This may be uh, due to variation in pollution source distribution or environment characteristic in each station. The there is a variation in quantity of micro plastic between station indicating different also the indicating different uh, in, uh, uh, in pollution pattern or water characteristic at each station. Next. Next, please. Sorry. Characteristic in micro Micro uh, plastic in water of current Cayenne River. Uh, this survey is conducted from April 23 to September 2023. Sampling was performed in six station in Cayenne River watershed, uh, namely station one in Sungai Buaya, station two in Jebatan Tanjung Selor to Tanjung Palas, uh, station three in Tanjung Palas Tengah, station four in Pelabuhan Cayenne. Station 5 in uh, Kota Kimaribu and Station 6 in Salim Batu. A uh, sample we collected was uh, water and sediment. Next. Based on the data, uh, microplastic shape on the water of the Cayenne River, the dominance, uh, the form dominance is film, is dominant at uh, station four, station six, and station one. Fragment has significant contribution to our station with the higher quantity of station four and station six. Fiber has the uh, substantial contribution to several uh, several station, but pilot have significant contribution at the station four and station six. The Film dominant from the microplastic uh, several research station, especially in station four and six, uh, likely comes from the various plastic product and other waste. And the contribution of fragment make 
uh, indicating the potential of larger plastic breakdown in the waters and the variation between trash station indicating difference on in a uh, pollution source and water characterizing at each station when we talk about the potential pollution in detail uh, especially from fragment and film in station four identifying a uh, pollution source at the station need further attention next the data from the micro plastic color is uh, we can see the black is dominant at station four, two and five. Brown, brown color has a significant contribution to all station, especially at station four and five and six. And transparency uh, dominant at station four and station five. The presence of the dominant color at each station indicated the variation in the type of micro plastic entering the water at least uh, at its location. Uh, the dominance of black and brown may be uh, indicated uh, by industrial waste, consumer good, or breakdown of color plastic in rich area. The dominance of transverse color may be uh, indicated the present and colorless or original from clear plastic fragment or pieces. The presence of the diverse color may be reflect the direct influence of human activity and the potential source of the uh, microplastic pollution from various activity around the research lo location. Next. Based on data of dominance of microplastic size range, where is uh, 100 to 500 uh, micrometer are dominant in our research station, which is uh, the highest quantity station four and lowers is station six, and size range from 40 to 60 micrometer also has a significant contribution in several stations. The dominant of microplastic size in the range 100 to 500 is indicated that uh, medium size microplastic have significant presence in the water. The variation in the quantity of microplastic between stations indicating the difference in pollution source or, or uh, water uh, characteristic at each station. The size uh, 40 to 60 has a significant contribution at several stations indicating uh, indicate a variation in uh, types of microplastic type of microplastic, uh, at each station. And the dominant size range of microplastic can provide clues about the source of microplastic pollution in the research area, such as uh, industrial or human activity around the water. Next. The data from the sediment of Cayenne River, especially on microplastic form in sediment, uh, we can see that fragment is dominant all uh, research station, which is biggest quantity at station four and station one. Film has significant contribution, actually, uh, especially in station three and station six. Paper also uh, present is significant quantity with this variation and each station. Uh, pellet has real question. Uh, pellet is a really relatively small contribution at the sum station. The fragment dominance of the microplastic form at all research station indicating the uh, potential for lager plastic breakdown in the waters. The contribution of film suggesting the source of microplastic may come from breakdown of plastic film material. Uh, the diversity in the quantity of fiber at this station may be a uh, reflect variation in source and characters of waste at this location. Especially for pellet, pellet have a re relatively small contribution but still need monitoring due to the, their larger size and potential impact. Next. Ms. Wara, what time I have left? Okay, uh, because we start late, you still have around five minutes, Parat, no? Five minutes, okay. Sorry, uh, maybe I will quick uh, my presentation. This is a uh, dominance of microplastic uh, according color as six research station. 
with dominance of brown and transparent so and the black next uh based on the microplastic size the size range and 100 to 500 uh dominance in our research station and then says 40 to 60 uh, and uh, 60 to 80 micrometer also have a significant contribution at same station uh, at some station sorry uh next the other uh our research about macro debris in the beaches of the tarakan city next uh Sampling was uh, research as conduct six beach location in Tarakan City, Tanjung Batu, Amal Baru, Amal Lama, Yuwata Laut, SDF, dan Amal Lama. Sample were taken based on the dry and raining season. Based on the data of Mercury during the dry and dry season, several conclusion can be uh, drawn. Next. In this uh, data, we can show the dominance on what the step uh, plastic is dominant type of the debris which is a significant quantity both during the dry season and the rainy season and other types of debris such as uh, wood, rubber and glass are so present in, consider, in considerable quantity or, or although not, uh, not as much uh, plastic some types of debris such as uh, fabric and glass show increasing quantity during the rainy season. This may be related to raining water carrying debris into the area. And the stability of the quantity of metal, paper, and plastic uh, between the, the dry and rainy season indicating that waiters factor may not have a significant uh, influence, uh, influence of this thief of the uh, types of these debris. Plastic remain uh, a major component showing its consistent contribution to the waste. Next. Uh, based on the, there is a different representation of macro debris between the season and the raining season. Uh, during the raining season, human activity open areas may be higher, such as a picnic or other activity, which is what well, increase the amount of macro debris left behind. So next, the conclu the conclusion of this uh, our presentation of today, the Kayan's Bakung Delta exposed to the microplastic. The finding indicates export to microplastic in Kayan's Bakung Delta is needed. Uh, the converse uh, the complexity of microplastic and microplastic distribution. Uh, in various ecosystems ranging from aquatic organisms and reform to the delta is need to know. Next. Implications, so we, when we talk about the plastic impact in coastal flora fauna, we, we apa, pose a serious challenge in maintaining the balance of coastal ecosystem, including habitat destruction, water sediments, pollution, Contaminant of seafood, effect of fish and marine organisms, disturb a uh, reproduction process, change in food availability, disease infection, uh, long term effect, disturbance, and, uh, disturbance in uh, bio geosymmetry, change in wildlife behavior, spread the endangered species, and influence on uh, coral ecosystem. So, we, uh, we need to talk about the implication this. Next. So when we talk about the implication, we need a uh, step forward to ecology harmony, such as a uh, based on potential impact, especially in Kayan Semaku Delta several step. So what ecology harmony uh, are crucial, including waster management technology, innovation, strengthening information policy, education awareness campaigns empowering local community, collaboration between institutions, and the integrated waste, manage, uh, waste management system. We need to improve all these uh, steps. Next. So in conclusion, uh, let's ask, let us uh, collectively, collectively uh, reflect on the urgency of working together to preserve ecological harmony in coastal ecosystem. 
the impact of plastic on flora and fauna uh, reflect the fragility of our uh, environmental uh, sustainability. However, uh, with awareness, education, and collaboration action, we can pave the way toward a more sustainable future. Uh, let us be agents of change in perversing the beauty and sustainability of coastal ecology, ensuring this valuable uh, heritage remain intact for future generation. And I want to say thank you for your attention and our shared commitment to creating a healthy and sustainable coastal ecosystem. Thank you for all uh, kind attention. Uh, I will end our uh, presentation with wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Atno Ahyani. It's a really interesting topic, yeah, your research. And for all the participants, if you have questions related to uh, Dr. Ratno Ahyani research result, please hold until the last uh, speakers, yeah, the third speakers, Pak Prof. Dodi Rido. And then now we move to the second keynote speakers, and we have uh, Pak Arjun Turnip, PhD. Good morning, Pak Arjun. Yeah, yes, good morning. Okay, while Pak Arjun preparing for the presentation, let me read the CV, ya, Pak Arjun. Arjun Turnip received the Bachelor's and Master Engineering degrees in Engineering Physics from the Institute of Technology, Bandung, ITB, Indonesia, in 1998 and 2003, respectively, and the PhD degree in Mechanical Engineering from Pusat Busan International University, Busan, Korea, under the World Class University Program in 2012. Uh, he is currently working in the Department of Electrical Engineering, Universitas Pajajaran, Indonesia, as a researcher and lecturer. And he received Student Travel Grant Award for the best paper from ICROSIZE International Joint Conference 2009. Certificate of Commendation, Superior Performance in Research and Active Participant for BK21 Program from Korean Government 2010, GMST Contribution Award for Most Citation of Bupati Samosir Award, yeah. For the role and activities of Samosir Development and his research areas are Integrated Vehicles Control, Adaptive control, nonlinear system theory, estimation theory, signal processing, and brain engineering, such as a brain computer interface. Dr. Arjun is chair of the IEEE Indonesia CSS RAS joint chapter and IEE student brains counselor of Universitas Pajajaran Indonesia. And he was an editor, editor of, of the Vidya Reset Journal and the Journal of uh, Mechatronics. Electrical Power and Vehicular Technology, GMF. Uh, he is the guest editor at the Indonesian Internet Working Journal, the International Journal of Intelligent Engineering and System, and the International Journal of Artificial Intelligence. And he is also a reviewer of the Artificial Intelligence in Medicine, Journal of Neuroscience Methods, Computers in Biology and Medicine, Biomedical Signal Processing and Control, Digital Signal Processing, Journal Microprocessor and Microsystem, Journal of Kings South University, Journal Sensor and Actuators, a Physical Open Agriculture Engineering Sciences, International Journal of Business Intelligence and Data Mining, Advances in Mechanical Engineering and Journal of Biological Psychology, and currently, he is coaching several universities on writing scientific papers, and research proposal. And currently, Dr. Arjun is the director of Toba Research Center and the general chair of the International Conferences on Artificial Intelligence and Mechatronic Systems, uh, Instrumentation, Control, and Automation, Information Technology International Seminar, and Smart Technology. Meanwhile, he completes four governmental projects as a project leader in title development and application of assistive intelligence system based biofeedback signal for clinic instrumentation development 
and application of a smart system detector for ECG signal abnormalities, development of NAFSA based DCI detection, and medical robot intelligence assistive technology for isolation patients. And all the projects are collaborate with Faculty of Medicine, Pajajaran University, and Hasan Sadikin Hospital. His Scopus Index 14 was Index 9 and Google Scholar Index 19. And today, Pa Arjun will present uh, the title about uh, Development of Intelligent Autonomous Drones for Spraying and Monitoring. Well, Pa Arjun, can we start the presentation, Pa Arjun? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Waro. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for Ms. Waro Kusmayani for the introduction, even if it's maybe too long. Uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, I'd like to present our one of the our lab research result. It's entitled it with the, the development of intelligent autonomous drone for spraying and monitoring. And as we know that uh, Indonesia is the, uh, the strategic condition for farming. However, uh, um, so many engineer or graduation from the farming but we are still importing and nobody want to become the farmer and one of our research is because of the the technology is still too old and then and mostly the farming is using the conventional one so nowadays we are starting for developing the drone one the wall this drone uh, we are developing it for autonomous. It means the drone without any remote. Uh, the drone can fly, uh, flying and then come back and then he can avoid if any uh, object in the middle of the way and also can do uh, spraying uh, based on the environment condition and also can reporting everything uh, in the farm and also reporting the condition of the uh, drone while uh, uh, flying like that. So yeah, this is the short introduction. So as we know, uh, this is the technology update. As we know, in from 2009, the reporter still using the, the chopper and then nowadays, after 10 years uh, later, uh, the recording of the information already used the drone. And, and we also have to be ready that the drone will become one of the transportation or maybe for delivering uh, everything, the tools for the future. So that's why we, we, we started for developing the drone, especially range for farming. So this is the, the development of the, the application of the I, IoT and big data in, in research. And of course, it should become the later on the drone when the drone becoming growing up. So everything should be uh, based on this uh, idea. So yeah, as we also get uh, the information from World Economic Forum, uh, that agriculture in 2025 will be uh, highly effective uh, uh, depend on artificial intelligence, on IoT and big data, and and so on like that. So, yeah, yeah, we invite all of the researchers in the world, especially in this forum, to join us and then do something related to this uh, request of the 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 word of the request like that. Okay, so this is the background as we can see here. Yeah, it is, I'm sorry, uh, writing in Indonesia, it is the number of uh, farmers in Indonesia. It is getting decreased from 2016 until 2020. It is the number of the farmers become getting increased. And also, however, uh, maybe one of the reasons is because of the people are going to the city and get another method to, for, the, for the daily life instead of maybe using of the land of uh, for doing farming like that. So maybe through the development of the technology, 
or for example, using the drone for spraying, using the drone for uh, estimated of the uh, farmer, farming uh, productivity and so on, and information of the farmer. Maybe uh, many people will be starting to, to, to love of how doing the farming like that. And also in another research, we found the, the graph in the in the bottom. So the number of the scientific paper related to the uh, drone uh, development it is getting increased in 2020. So maybe it is one of the reasons that maybe because maybe many people already prepare that the drone will become later on become one of the main transportation method tools maybe in the farmer maybe or, or daily life or maybe food delivering instead of using gojek like that or gopher like that so yeah be ready for that then we are doing uh, related to the rest of the so this is the farming we are doing artificial intelligence precision farming in the in the precision farming we are measure information from the the land uh, all information that's that uh, put the sensor in the land and then you get the data and then this data will be sent to the, to the website and then it could be applied. Some data will be sent to the drone such, such that the drone can do something related to the information from the from the our plant like that. So this kind of thing, farming based on the internet of thing and artificial intelligence starting to begin nowadays. And then of course, Doing this kind of piece, we are from electro, electrical engineering, cannot do without uh, collaboration with the uh, agriculture uh, faculty like that. So, for in this work, we are collaborating collaborate with the agriculture faculty from Pajdaran, maybe some university from Bandung. So this is. Uh, some, uh, several instruments that we put and we develop this sensor. Some of them are microcontrollers are developed by our lab. And then we put here and then can transmit the data and then record the data. Then we, it just goes to the, to the cloud. Like that. So this is uh, our uh, student working in, in, the, in the farm while installing all wiring and everything and doing the experiment like that. So this is the scheme of the farm based on artificial intelligence. Yeah, all these data are ready in the website uh, in online. And then some of the data will be used for the drone. Yeah, spraying and then flying like that. So in the development of the drone, we it is uh, divided, become three groups. One group is for uh, navigation and then one group is for uh, spraying system. Uh, control and then one group is for monitoring like that. So for the whole of this is we call it the autonomous drone farming for precision in monitoring and spraying one. So this is the scheme of monitoring one. It means the drone will be uh, do communication and using the protocol such that the information around uh, the drone can be recorded and then uh, reported to the to the to the station, the cloud. And then it could be used for other part of the the farming one. So we are doing develop all, all all the drone are developing in our lab from the beginning because uh, as we know maybe there's and the drone available in the market and one thing is it is still using remote control. Then the secondly, it is very expensive, and in this part we are developing it uh, from the beginning. Then all algorithms are programming in using the Python, and then using microcontroller. And that thing. yeah. So this is the database in the in the back uh, back end. Information are uh, recorded here in the cloud. Then for any application, and then this is one of the table how uh, the drone when flying and then send the data in real time. We also measure all information from uh, the drone, including the latitude, longitude, and then the battery information, wind, wind speed, and the water volume in the, in the drone, 
and, and other information. So this will be processing. That's why we call it smart monitoring because all the data will become processing for other for the decision, other application, and in this is uh, some collection of the data in the several experiments. Actually, here we 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 did twelve experiment uh, after developing the, uh, the 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 drone. Then we for validation and testing we are we we did. 12 experiments, like uh, using the uh, uh, direct uh, scenario and then using S uh, scenario, using uh, UW form of the scenario. It means we, we make the drone uh, in, in, diff, in, in 12 ways such that we can evaluate how uh, the drone when cornering how the drone where uh, it is uh, it is doing several cornering and then come back to the to the to the stage and like that. So all uh, will be evaluated in the 12, 12 experiment. And then this is uh, one of the ex uh, information when when the drone uh, fly, we can get the data that the 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 value of the altitude longitude. And then uh, ground speed and battery information, and then also spraying level. Uh, of course, the in one of the uh, goal of this research is how to control the the spraying level according to the uh, drone position. When the drone out of the the line, which means the spraying should be reduced or maybe should be stopped. When the wind is very high, the maybe. The, the the spraying will should be increased as that it could uh, uh, the water can reach the, 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 the plant like that. Yeah, there are so many uh, scenarios that uh, possibly uh, happen when the when uh, the drone flying according to the wind speed, according to the the the, the height of the altitude and longitude position. And also, especially uh, to the GPS correction error, because uh, the, G the the current GPS still has uh, such kind of fifty to one meter error. So it's kind of thing. It is very high impacted when the drone has to, to watering the plant. The such kind of condition, for example, of the Chile, it is uh, they have such kind of uh, guidance to be followed. So, uh, this is example of the drone. How we uh, this is the the floppy drone. Mean all the battery and then and then the, the microcontroller and then protocol are uh, built in our lab. This drone should follow this line, and then or when uh, the drone moves to height or maybe it is out of the line, then it should be corrected instead of the spraying. Uh, uh, condition can do accurately. So after finishing the spraying, based on the the area of the pump to be watering, the drone will be automatically come back and then take landing. This is so when the drone uh, fly, so we can see uh, all information using image and video will be transmitted to the PC, and then it, it could be also can be monitoring in, the, in our smartphone, other uh, equipment that connected to the Wi-Fi. So we can 
get the all information from the drone during the speed, the better condition, the latitude, the altitude, then and also the graph also can be directed. And the data also recorded in the cloud. So 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 if anytime we need the data, it can be uh, obtained. Okay. So this is also one example of the data history in the website. And then this is the layout of the information. And when it is displayed in the phone, it is displayed in the tablet, also when it is displayed in the PC or laptop like that. So it's kind of really, it is based on the website. So you don't need any application, just connect to the website and then get the link, you can get the information. So in this one, we try to see and to validate uh, how the data transmitted uh, about the time of uh, delivering and arriving data uh, from the drone to get it here. Yes, for example, the left side is beginning the actual time, then the right side is beginning the, the time on the website. It's been, it is has such kind of uh, latency. Then we try to make the latency as short as possible. So this kind of thing, uh, it is very important when uh, we need the real-time uh, communication data. So the latency and the digital uh, value should be as uh, small as possible. So it is, this is one of the parameters, how the algorithm and all, all of the control system well working in the our after our drone. So we get the time of this. Very Parjun, it seems that Parjun has uh, technical problems. Mas Kiki and Mas Novi, can you check Parjun? Already joined in Zoom. Oke, okay, Parjun. Ya, yeah, sorry, sorry. Oke, okay, ya. Yeah. Sorry, uh, I miss off the charging. Oke, okay, oke. Okay. Can we continue, Parjun? Ya, yeah, ya, yeah, oke. Okay. I will continue. Uh, how many time? How many, how long they still? Oke, okay, still five minutes, Parjun. Oke, okay. oh, still five minutes. Ya. Yeah. So, time up, so okay, thank you. So, this is the result of when we evaluate uh, using the uh, how the, the prediction of spraying using reg linear regression for the spraying one, one of the methods for the spraying. Just, then this is the result we get the precision recall if one uh, score is very high. I mean, the, the, the prediction model is well in the blocking question. And this, this is the validation using the the real condition compared with the uh, model classification result, you get uh, the accuracy more than 95%. So this is for uh, testing for me in 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 12, uh, uh, experiment for latency and jitter. I mean we can see the jitter means it is the deviation of the time the delivery of the data. It is very important when we are look for the 
the real time uh, story. Also, for, for, for example, in a video delivering confirmation. So, however, in this experiment, in 12 condition of experiment scenario, we get uh, even the latency and jitter uh, value is very small. Average is uh, only a few percent uh, error. Okay. So this the third scenario of experiment uh, for in in the for reading the data, and then this is for delivering and reading the data latency and data, and then this is the plot for the twelve of the experiment. The comparison of the latency, we get only an in several point of uh, data of experiment we get uh, with the high. And jitter and uh, just the value of the jitter and the latency a little bit high. However, average still good. And then uh, this is the average for the all experiment. Get the table. Then this is another uh, example from the altitude uh, data accuracy. And then this is for longitude data accuracy. And then this is uh, for the latitude uh, data accuracy. Again, it's very, very, very small error. And then this is for the coordinate and then, and then error altitude. Uh, it is also the average, also very small. And then this is the plot of the error for all. Get it? Uh, the error is very only one uh, or spiral point. Even also, it's still also very small. I mean, the latency and the transferring of the data is very good. Or from the drone, the station <laughs> in real time. So this is the, the regression used for the spray. We get the result in this way. Okay. So for the conclusion, so you are we have a built from the pro, uh, pro, protocol communication using map mapping and web socket and HTTP and TCP and the deep uh, deep learning neural network used for monitoring. The training is uh, in the deployment we get 93 percent of point five, and the average for latency and data is about only 352 milliseconds, and also uh, the average for this error only uh, 0 0.026 uh, for altitude and latitude and longitude respectively. We can conclude that the, the, the evaluation for the spraying and then uh, monitoring uh, communi uh, protocol communication is very good, accepted from the, of the drone. So I think that's all uh, for our result. Hopefully, this can be open uh, the audience mind maybe in the future to develop the same things and also also doing the collaboration with us. We are welcoming all of you. Thank you very much. Then okay, I thank you. <laughs> thank you, Pak uh, pa Arjun Turni, PhD, already share amazing yeah, project with uh, development of uh, drone yeah, for monitoring and spraying, yeah, Pak Arjun. And be ready to have several questions from the participants after uh, Prof. Dodi Rido Nurohmat present uh, the material, yeah, Parjun, yeah. Okay, well, uh, Prof. Dodi, good morning, Prof. Dodi. Morning, Bu. Okay, so. Uh, Mohon maaf tadi terpental. It's just. Uh, okay, leave. yeah, Pak. Yeah, okay. Okay, Prof. Dodi, let me read your CV first while preparing uh, your presentation, yeah, Prof. Dodi. Okay. Okay. Prof. Dodi Rido Nurahmat is a professor of forest policy and economics and dean of graduate school at IPB University Bogor, Indonesia. And he graduated bachelor at IPB and completed his master's and PhD at Göttingen University, Germany. Yeah, summa cum laude. Yeah. He previously served as a vice rector for international affairs, collaboration, and alumni relations to 2021 until 2023, Vice Rector for Collaboration and Information Systems, 2018 until 2021, and subsequently also uh, the Chairman of the Forwarek 
kerjasama Forum of the Indonesian Vice Rectors for Collaboration 2019 until 2022, Director of Strategic Studies uh, Studies and Agriculture Policy 2013 until 2018, ya, yeah. and Director of Career Development and Alumni Affairs IPB 2008 until 2013, and in the scientific community, he served as the Chairman of the Scientific Advisory Board of Indonesian Forestry Scholars Association, Persak, Persaki, and Alternate International Council of the International Union of Forest Research Organization, Advisory Editorial Board in some reputable international journal, such as the Journal of Forest Policy, al Safir, and Economic Journal of Forest and Society, Journal of Tropical Forest Management, and several others. And he visited some prominent universities such as MIT, Harvard, Stanford, and NUS, uh, NUS yeah, to initiate collaboration and also serves as a guest visiting professor, course, of, uh, course supervisor, and examiner at University of Malaya, Roskil, uh, Roskilde University, Gottingen University, Oxford University, Leeds University, Michigan University, Adelaide, and some other universities in Asia, Europe, and the USA. And he is actively involved in the policy dialogues in several regional, ASEAN, national, and local policy-making process. He has conducted scientific research and consultancies, mainly elaborating on socioeconomics and policy aspect of carbon and climate change, forest management and environment, including various issues of land use change and nature conservation, deforestation, sustainable forest management, timber and non-timber forest products and marketing, a green fiscal policy, sustainable development, as well as emission reduction and climate change in cooperation with national institutions and international agencies or consultants, such as World Bank, ADB, UNDP, UNRED, GGGI, US, uh, USAH, yeah, GIZ, uh, Koicha, Ito, LPM, and etc. Well, okay, Prof. Dodi Grido Nurohmat. Okay, what will uh, you present for today's uh, conference, Prof? <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, allow me to uh, share a screen. Yes. Okay, thank you. Could I start my presentation? Yes, Prof, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I would like to share uh, with you about the ecological harmony, yeah, uh, building resilience uh, to climate change, biodiversity, and environment. Uh, the what is in the harmony actually? In the harmony is uh, 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 what says uh, the principle of uh, the sustainable sustainable development. And the balance between growth and uh, environmental sustainability. So, if we talk about the uh, sustainable development, then we have to uh, talk about the economic growth and environmental uh, sustainability. And uh, it includes uh, various aspects, not only uh, biodiversity and climate, but also social economy, uh, ecology, and uh, some other aspects. And uh, uh, talking about sustainable development, we have to talk about uh, green growth. Green growth is a tool to achieve sustainable development, not a competing paradigm. Yeah? So uh, green and growth is not a competing, competing paradigm. Green growth is a growth that is environmentally sustainable, uh, characterized by the first is efficient, the second is clean, and uh, the third is resilient. So if a certain product line has the green products, but it is not efficient, it means it is not the uh, not the green product at all. Yeah. If we find a product that uh, have uh, uh, what is this, uh, high prices because of, of inefficiency, it means it is not uh, green products. But if we uh, respect to the farmer and give the high price to organic uh, pro uh, products, for example, yeah, it is a green product, but uh, the product uh, that uh, getting uh, uh, high price, higher price, not because of uh, the respect uh, to the farmer, but because of inefficiency, it is uh, definitely not a green uh, product. So uh, sometimes uh, it is 
uh, it is difficult yeah, to di di differentiate what is the green product, what is the green action, what is the green principles. Sometimes uh, we think that it is a uh, green action, but uh, actually it is uh, not a green, yeah, not a green action, but it is a green spirit only, for example, like a car free day. I think I I, I don't think so that a car free day is a, a green action, yeah, but it is green spirit because uh, you know usually in Jakarta, for example, I don't know in Tarakan, I think it is almost the same in Jakarta in Bogor. Yeah, usually uh, people come to the car free day uh, zone to the Sudirman and Tamperan Street in Jakarta. But I didn't believe that uh, they come to the uh, Jakarta uh, car free day uh, zone like the Sudirman and Tamperan uh, 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 using bicycle, for example, or uh, by walk, for example, yeah, by foot. <laughs> no, usually they go by car and uh, bring their bicycle in this car and uh, just stop in the parking area. And then they enjoy uh, the uh, car free day. And then uh, they run perhaps with a uh, training suite, yeah, running about 10 meters and then eating. Yeah, eating ketoprak, eating gado-gado, eating <laughs> many things, yeah. Yeah, uh, three plates, yeah. So eating more than expected, I think. But it is it is okay. I think we uh, it is no need to uh, prohibit uh, this activity. It is a, it is a definitely not a green action, but uh, I think it is uh, it will be increase the happiness index. So Okay, it seems that uh, Prof. Dodi Rido has problem, yeah, technical problems with his Zoom. And we will wait until uh, Prof. Dodi can join with us. Sorry, I have a very bad internet connection. It's just uh, okay. Okay, this is reconnecting. Dodi, yeah. And maybe I uh, close okay. my video, yeah. Yeah. Okay, you can see my presentation. Yes, Prof. Yeah. Okay. So and the environmental sustainability is a characterized by efficient and clean and uh, resilient and uh, uh, sustainable development is sustaining sustaining development. Uh, what is uh, sustaining development? 
the principle is uh, the elements is good and in equity with a minimum level of environmental degradation. So what's what we call it the green. And uh, yeah, understanding sustainable development, uh, we should understand the uh, pattern of uh, the development. So if we see that uh, at the left side is the exploitation, yeah, and the growth pace and uh, and the uh, right uh, right hand is a conservation or green side, but uh, every country uh, should uh, follow this uh, what we call as what we what we call it uh, the and from a constant constant curve. So and uh, uh, developing countries, the developing countries usually uh, follow the a step that the uh, economic growth, yeah, but at the same time the uh, environmental degradation also increase. So it is the situation, yeah, until uh, we meet the turning point that uh, the economic growth and at the same time, the environmental uh, degradation decrease. So we improve the environmental degradation. But the situation is uh, the turning turning point situation, usually uh, almost all, uh, the country that's having a, a turning point of environmental degradation are developing uh, developed countries. Not developing countries. So, uh, who uh, uh, declare as uh, forest lovers, for example, usually uh, stay in the country that have no uh, forest anymore because of uh, this kind of uh, uh, Kuznet curve. And uh, this is uh, the concept of uh, sustainability, actually, that uh, sustainability is uh, not a point, yeah? sustainability is not a line, but the sustainability is a path. Sustainability is a path between irreversibility line and adaptability line. So according to Leslie, for example, Leslie talked uh, about uh, uh, limits and tolerance. So uh, it is uh, sustainable as long as it is in between irreversibility line and adaptability line, or in between limits and tolerance. Yeah, we didn't need to make a zero degradation, no, because every uh, development needs uh, a certain kind of uh, temporary uh, destruction, temporary destruction, but. We cannot uh, make an offer exploitation that uh, uh, lead to the uh, was a catastrophe because of irre irreversibility of the nature. So I think uh, it is in between, yeah, in between the uh, right of the human, the mandate of the human from the God as uh, the earth manager, as a uh, Khalifa will art, yeah. Uh, but uh, it is also uh, was this warning that we cannot make uh, damaging on the earth. Boleh membuat kerusakan di muka bumi. So in between, in between, that is the sustainability. It is a harmony, actually. Sustainability is in between, is a path in between irreversibility line and adaptability line. So how about the uh, zero degradation? Zero degradation, de degradation is mubazir, yeah. It is also not good, yeah, because uh, actually uh, human and uh, also all uh, uh, what's it says uh, 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 flora and fauna also didn't need <laughs> zero degradation. We have a level of tolerance, yeah. Makan jatuh belum lima menit ya nggak apa-apa tambah sehat. Karena seperti itu ya. Jadi nggak perlu juga. We didn't need to drink. Uh, Aqua destilata, yeah. It's a uh, normal water, it's okay. Even though it is uh, some perhaps uh, uh, not uh, very dangerous yeah, bacteria and so on. But uh, it is uh, the human, it is life. We didn't need uh, zero degradation. It is Mubazir. Mubazir also pekerjaan setan. So I think, uh, yeah, uh, not too much also. So uh, in between, di tengah-tengah itu yang terbaik, ya, yeah? in between irreversibility line and adaptability line in between limits and tolerance. So this is the principle. So the sustainability is a path between irreversibility line and uh, adaptability line. Yeah, in between limits and 
toleran. How about eh Pak Dodi, uh, how to know about the, the limit and tolerance? The limit and tolerance following the concept of daya dukung and daya tampung, the concept of kapas, carrying capacity. This is the concept, ya. Yeah? So what we uh, need actually is defining the carrying capacity in certain place and certain uh, situation, certain condition. This is the important thing that uh, yeah we didn't uh, conducted uh, the calculation or measurement of the carrying capacity right now. Yeah, uh, perhaps uh, yes in the research level in several places, but actually uh, we need yeah in the national level and also of course in the regional level to uh, measure uh, the carrying capacity yeah to know uh, the limits and tolerance of uh, certain kind of natural resources so uh, sustainable development is uh, like uh, choosing the situation of the uh, traffic jam situation if we would like to uh, develop a new uh, road or ring road like in bogor with jalan baru the new uh, street but actually it is not new because since uh, I was a student uh, 35 years ago, the name is already Jalan Baru. But uh, <laughs> the name is, uh, reminds Jalan Baru because it is continuous, uh, never-ending uh, construction. I mean, <laughs> always reconstruction in the uh, street. So I think it is a, it is an option. We would like to uh, enjoy the uh, good uh, infrastructure, uh, road infrastructure, for example, by uh, closing the existing road and then uh, build the new one, the flying over, for example. Yeah. So uh, if we if we close totally the existing uh, road, then the impact will be high. But we will enjoy the flyover sooner, faster then if we close only a part of the road the broader the road uh, open the existing road uh, open on the smaller the uh, closing road then the uh, what it says uh, uh then the flyover yeah will be with uh, longer so we will take a longer time so it is a, like a choice it is a, like a system like a uh, choices or option of sustainable development. We develop uh, very fast with a high environmental degradation as long as below the uh, intolerance, as long as below the limits, and then recovery faster. Or we develop uh, a bit uh, slower, but also getting turning point also slower. It is a, a choices. So, uh, uh, its place perhaps has uh, different uh, choices and different optimum situation. So, development limits and tolerance is talking about environmental recovery or uh, limits and human adapt adaptation capacity or tolerance, irreversibility and adaptability. Yeah, not over exploitation, exploitation, but no need also zero degradation. So, uh, the Ecological harmony is uh, not uh, talking about uh, preservation, actually. Yeah, but the harmony. The harmony is uh, what it says, uh, depend on the situation, time, and places. So you cannot imagine that uh, the situation now is the same as the situation one million years ago, for example. The optimum ecosystem in its time is different. Humans or living things have capacity of adaptation. Yeah, don't doubt about that. Yeah, don't doubt uh, of the uh, living things uh, adaptability uh, capacity. Jangan pernah meremehkan ciptaan Tuhan ya. Beradaptasi itu salah satu bagian dari uh, apa uh, struggle ya. The extinction of a certain species of living things is the enabling condition for the existence of other species. What human life would be comfortable if there was no extinction of prehistoric uh, species like dinosaurs, for example? Yeah, Buwaro and me, and we are just uh, 
uh, make a zoom ya yeah, zoom conference and then uh, suddenly a T-Rex ya yeah, behind yours it's terrible you know we cannot uh, live coexisting with T-Rex so the extinction of the uh, dinosaurs of the uh, what is this uh, Jurassic species is a blessing for the human life you know so don't think uh, like uh, romanticism ah if i live like it's, uh, it's nothing so what we live know it is the best and we we should try to do our best to improve our life right now but uh, don't think too much about uh, if the extension is nature i think it is uh, the way of nature yeah Uh, uh, was uh, 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 I took a, a PhD examination, for example, then and the PhD student uh, present about the situation in uh, the research site uh, 200 years ago that is still forested area, but it's very very green and so on and so forth, and now becoming a campo who I. Uh, to stay like uh, two years ago if you don't didn't like to uh, stay like the condition two years ago then don't 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 talk about two years ago just talk about uh, the current situation yeah because if we talk about uh, two years ago then everything is forest ibb campus also forest for example 500 years ago for example yeah ibb campus also forest so if we talk about uh, 500 years ago, 300 years ago, and then we're taking a Zoom meeting uh, on the trees, for example, yeah, sambil gelantungan gitu, kalau mau. Ya, kan nggak seperti itu, gitu. Uh, don't take uh, like a romanticism. It is uh, not, not useful at all, yeah. So don't take realistic, yeah. You think uh, and the uh, present situation and do your best. Do our best in the uh, situation. Oh. So, we come to the uh, sustainable development principles, and then we, if we talk about the uh, development principle or harmony, then we have to follow the uh, sustainable development principle. The first one is following the national development goals that are justice, welfare, and sustainable. So, like uh, if we you talk if we talk about climate change, then we should talk about the climate justice, not climate equality. The justice is different with equality. And if we talk about sustainability, yeah, I prefer to talk about regenerative sustainability. No. of uh, ecological aspect, economic aspect, social aspect, yeah, it's integrative sustainability. Transformative sustainability is like uh, making, uh, we already uh, talked about, like the green growth, that is uh, 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 still the transformative sustainability. But regenerative sustainability is more than that. So perhaps we make the destruction, but as long as the technology can cause this uh, uh, problem, then it's okay. Yeah, perhaps uh, the population increase, but as long as the technology, the efforts, and uh, everything, technology in, including the green technology, of course, can uh, produce the food more than uh, we uh, need, then it's okay. It is regenerative sustainability. So uh, don't think that uh, the next generation has the same requirements. Yeah, uh, the same requirements, uh, uh, totally same with us. No. If we can uh, make a telecommunication, uh, yeah, or teletransporter, and we uh, communicate with our ancient ancestor, yeah, uh, 1,000 years ago, for example, and then many things uh, they didn't know about our life, no. 
they just think that uh, uh, to survive we have to have a capacity for uh, berburu dan meramu for uh, gathering and uh, hunting so if uh, my ancestor my grand 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 grandfather asked me what is uh, what is uh, your expertise hunting or gathering oh i am a lecturer i am a professor what is professor they didn't know so don't think that uh, the next generation is the same with us yeah the need of the next generation is the uh, the same with us so uh, just uh, wise about that because uh, we cannot uh, even uh, uh, make the forecast forecasting 50 years uh, yeah. so uh, if we uh, forecast uh, the occupation of our our uh, grandson for example 50 years next in the future then uh, perhaps only 20% the uh, uh what's says the possibility yeah of our uh what's says a prediction is right 80 percent wrong so like that it is it's, it's, it is it is uh, uh sometimes uh, unpredictable and uh, the second one is uh following the scientific approach logic and systematic don't just uh, follow the uh, uh common sense you know if uh, many people think uh, oh, Indonesia is uh, the greatest uh, emission uh, countries, something like that. Oh, uh, uh, what's it says? Uh, the forest is uh, the earth, yeah, the lung of the earth, something like that. Is it true? I think we have to criticize that one. Yeah. If uh, the forest is the lung of the earth. We will die if we go to Kebun Raya, Botanical Garden. You will die if you go to the forest. Why? Because lung absorb oxygen and release carbon dioxide. The forest is vice versa. Not the same apa itu kiasan. Kiasan pun juga harus sesuai. Kalau enggak kita mudah sekali uh, apa menerima sesuatu yang enggak logis. Kita terima begitu saja. It is very important to always thinking logic, thinking logic, because we are scientific community. Okay, sorry, so, Prof. You still have five minutes to complete, Prof. Okay, itu sudah selesai. Ya, yeah? because we are scientific community. Ya, yeah? we have to uh, uh, think uh, scientific. Ya, yeah? hanya ada dua yang enggak sulit dikasih tahu secara ilmiah. Orang yang sedang jatuh cinta, yang pertama mampu cinta, orang mampu cinta itu susah dikasih tahu. Yang kedua pendukung capres, itu susah dikasih tahu untuk ilmiah. <laughs> nah ini juga, ya. Yeah. If we uh, look at the, this uh, information, this graph, then we, we know that actually uh, Indonesia emission per capita of uh, uh, the Indonesian people is only 2.01 ton per capita per year, ya. Yeah. It is uh, uh, much less compared to the average per capita, emission per capita, 4.4. If we compare uh, to Qatar, for example, the highest uh, country with uh, the highest uh, uh, emission per capita, 37.9, or US, for example, 15 uh, ton uh, per capita, then where is the justice? If the NDC nationally determined contribution is determined by percentage, Never justice. Have to define the nationally determined contribution by the absolute threshold. So if we agree, if we know the data that the uh, was it says emission per capita in average is four point four, and then we do agree, uh, we are all yeah all people over the world do agree that we should uh, uh, reduce emission by 30%, and then the threshold is 4.4 minus 30%, let's say 3.8, for example. yeah. And then all people, all countries in all over the world should follow yeah, the 3.8 emission per capita. So it will be different, the situation in Indonesia and the US, the situation in Jakarta and Tarakan, different. The situation in Tarakan and the uh, was this, remote area of Papua, it should be different because it is not fair if we uh, stop the emission uh, to our brother and sister in the remote area of Papua just to 
for example, uh, buy motorcycle, for example. Oh, don't buy motorcycle because, because we have all that thing. You have to reduce your emission. No, it is not fair. It is not justice. It is equality, but not justice. So we have to do everything that we can. Yeah, we have to uh, uh, always uh, sounding the climate justice. Ya, yeah, saya selalu perjuangkan ini enggak benar. Walaupun although we follow the the the, the rules, we follow the convention right now. But uh, uh, something that uh, we have to uh, fight, yeah, about the justice, we have to say, we have to say, yeah. In the international fora, I always say also in the COP, yeah, COP twenty seven in uh, Samasa in uh, Egypt and uh, last year in Dubai, I always uh, uh, try to uh, to uh, to say about the uh, the truth. The truth, yeah. So we we have to uh, 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 try uh, the uh, climate justice by, for example, not uh, by percentage of uh, the total emission, but uh, the absolute number of uh, the average uh, emission per capita, yeah, in each country. That is uh, the truth. Because uh, by uh, doing the truth, then we can reach our target. Yeah, to stop the increasing temperature uh, by 1.5 percent in 2060. If not, if uh, we do like a percentage, yeah, like now, like the current situation, then our target will never uh, achieve. Yeah. So this is uh, our process. The the sec the third principle, the following: the reduction of target, measurable, evidence based, and achievable. And I have a. Uh, some uh, publication, yeah. Perhaps you can uh, uh, read in uh, our publication of policy and economics and as uh, last year, yeah, about the simulation of uh, the what is this, uh, uh, Indonesian development, whether we will reach a high income country, yeah. Kalau sekarang kan lagi musim Indonesia emas itu bisa tercapai nggak sih gitu? Degradasinya berapa sih? Bagaimana cara mencapainya dan sebagainya? And uh, and uh, others in the other side, we we see the uh, evidence that uh, you know that the higher uh, per capita income, yeah, usually following by the higher per capita emission, this uh, crap yeah everywhere. So we have to be very very careful if we uh, 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 reduce the emission because. If we didn't uh, uh, take it carefully, then it, it will be reduced the per capita income. It will stop the development. Of course, there are uh, some strategy exception, like uh, uh, improving the productivity of rice land, improving the productive agriculture, something like that. It will uh, simultaneously increasing the per capita income and reducing per capita emission. So uh, something like that, we have to uh, try to do uh, our best, yeah, based on uh, scientific uh, evidence, yeah, evidence, not facts, yeah, because uh, facts is not evidence, yeah. Tidak uh, semua fakta terbukti, tapi semua bukti adalah fakta. So scientific is always talking about evidence, not facts finding, but evidence based. So uh, this is lesson learned from. Uh, several areas that actually we can do something. Don't follow uh, the hoax, the rumor, or just a common sense, but follow the scientific evidence. Yeah. So like keterlanjuran uh, sawit, yeah. we can improve with uh, enrichment planting. Yeah, seperti ini yang di sebelah kiri bisa, ini di Jambi bisa sebenarnya technically. Yeah. Kemudian uh, conflicting, conflicting area already 40 years a conflict in Lampung, for example, and then uh, every people uh, now happy because uh, of uh, planting uh, high commercial trees like avocado, durian, and so on, and uh, they are very uh, happy. The people now uh, very rich, yeah, with uh, high productivity, and also in Java, also Kampung Durian. It is uh, also an extreme situation of uh, ex mining area in Grese is Java that uh, now becoming uh, one of the richest village in Indonesia, I think. Salah satu desa yang terkaya di Indonesia. Uh, nama, nama wisatanya itu wisata, wisata 
stigi desanya desa Skapuk. Silakan uh, searching di internet ya. Jadi kepala desanya mobilitasnya apa, penggawa-penggawanya Pak Ciro dan sebagainya. Mungkin seperti pejabat di UBT mungkin ya. Jadi <laughs> mereka sangat uh, sangat menikmati begitu. Itu karena apa? Kan out of the box. Berpikirnya positive thinking. Ya, tidak selalu oh, ini enggak boleh, ini enggak boleh segala macam, tapi yang penting ada yang terpenting adalah functional thinking. Ya, do the best and optimis gitu. Dan itu yang kami lakukan bersama-sama dengan masyarakat di Garut misalnya kita membuat agroforestry dan pohon-pohon yang komersial. I think that's all uh, of my presentation. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oke, okay, thank you Prof uh, Dodi Rido Nurokset with the amazing presentation about green growth and sustainable development. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, now we move to question and answer session. Uh, we have we already uh, listened to the keynote speakers, uh, the first from Pak Dr. Ratno Ahyani with microplastic waste and its uh, impact, yeah, especially uh, in fish and waters, yeah. And then the second keynote speakers, uh, Pak Arjon Turnit, PhD, with the development of intelligent autonomous drone for, for spraying and monitoring. And then the last one from Prof. Dodi Ridor Nurahmat with uh, green growth and sustainable development. Okay, you can raise up your hands and then uh, you can turn on your microphone and please, uh, Ask question to the keynote speakers uh, for the first session, and you can also uh, write down your question in the chat box, and I will read the question to the keynote speakers. Okay, any questions, all the participants? We have completed with three keynote speakers with three different topics. And all the topics really amazing, interesting. We learned something today. Okay, still waiting for the question. So please, okay, Pasat Egra, hi, Pasat Egra. Please turn on your camera, we miss you. Hello, how are you, Pasat Egra? Alhamdulillah, I'm fine. Okay. Yeah, Pasat Egra. Okay, question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, question uh, for Paratno, uh, Pak Arjun, or Prof. Dodi. The question will be delivered to whom? Uh, first, maybe for the Mr. Ratno. Ratno. Yeah. <laughs> Pak Dr. Ratno, you will have question from Pasat Egra. Yeah, uh, first, thank you very much for your uh, change and then also a uh, great presentation from the, all of the speakers. Honorable, then I can ask uh, asking for one of them. Uh, Mr. Ratno, I'm interested that uh, you research in the surrounding of the Tarakan. And then also, I am one of the. Uh, I am one of the. My, my 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 favorite food is the fish. Then I just worry about that about your research result. Then after hear about your research, I just worry about my uh, my health, my condition. After the fish. We include the microplastic. How does it solution or suggestion about the cultivate the fish with the safe condition surrounding Tarakan, or maybe you have any solution about that. Then another question for Mr. Uh, Dr. Arjun. Sorry, okay. can you hear my voice? Yeah, Parjun, be ready. Yeah. The yes, question can, for you, Pak okay. Arjun. Okay. Yes. Yes, I'm interested in that also the condition of the agriculture today. That's the technology I hope is going to increase. 
day by day and year by year in Indonesia. Now I'm in Japan. So in the near of the, our university, there is some farmer here. Sometimes I just uh, surprised that farmer in Japan, mostly they not touch directly their farmer by their foot, but they touch the farmer by the mizzens. But in Indonesia, condition may be the farmer, younger farmer, not the farmer, uh, petani muda, younger farmer is not this, like, such as like your uh, my is uh, how to improve the, their our their younger farmer interest in the farmer condition in the farming today because and then also the field of, of the farmers also decrease but in the future we need a lot of the a lot of the uh rice stock do, do you have any ideas how to invite how to to make interest of the younger farmer. Thank you very much for only two questions. Mr. Woro, did you get my question? Hello? Yes. Mr. Mrs. Woro? Parjun? Did you get my question? Parjun, hello? Yes, yes. Shall I? Uh, okay. okay. Can you get the question from pa Saat Egra? The point of yeah. the question? I, I, I can predict, but it is not 100% correctly. I hear because the voice is not so good. So, But I can predict. Maybe if, if my answer not correctly for you, you can you can ask me again. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Only question, Pak Saat Egra. For Pak Dr. Autno Ahyani and Pak Arjun, yeah? Yes. Okay, thank you, Pak Saat Egra. Now we will give time for Pak Dr. Ratno Ahyani to answer your question. Pak Dr. Ratno Ahyani already prepared the, the answer for the question? Of course, the, uh, the question is very hard, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so difficult okay. question. Okay, uh, Mr. Egra, the presence of microplastic in the Takayan Sebakung, especially in uh, Kota Tarakan, is of significant importance in both uh, so environment and for the people, of course. Oh, so <clears throat> uh, there is a uh, some important things he wants for to do for the uh, to reduce this. First, maybe I will talk about the conservation significance, knowledge of the presence of the microplastic uh, in the delta is provide a foundation for conservation and and for the protection effort. This is included initiation or initiative to reduce plastic use and improve faster uh, improve us waste management the second thing maybe we talk about the monitoring development uh, change stroke the monitoring uh, microplastic uh, we can understand change in consumption patterns waste disposal and the impact uh, of human activity on the environment in the Delta Kayan, of course. And the step once is raising uh, public awareness, information about the oppression of microplastic and raise public awareness. So today I want to awareness us about this. <laughs> so raise uh, public awareness about the environmental issue is stimulation, uh, preventive and protect action to reduce their impact and maybe the next step is uh, development the environmental uh, 
develop apa development of uh, environmental policy uh, research of research on the microplastic uh, can provide a scientific basis for developing more effective environmental policy uh, including the regulation on plastic use and waste management so the understanding the presence in the microplastic of the alkyon is not uh, uh sorry is not uh, related to ecosystem sustainability but also uh, human health and overall well-being the local community maybe that's the my answer mr egra thank you okay clear enough pasat egra or you still have another question <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm enough. Uh, okay, enough. <laughs> okay, now we move to the second question for thank you, thank you. Pak Arjun. Pak Arjun, hello. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. Pak Arjun. Okay, can so, you answer uh, the question from Pak Saat Egra, Pak Arjun? Yeah, okay. I actually, I didn't get the explanation before the question. Mm -hmm. The question is how to attract the younger farmer. Yes. Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, seems, I don't know what's the correlation with the farmer in the bar, maybe, but I can predict. So maybe in my assumption, as we know, uh, a long time ago, the taxi driver, not many people want to be the taxi driver, or maybe want to be project driver. However, when it is supported by the technology and internet of things, Go car, like, yeah, it's similar with taxi driver. We call go car nowadays or project nowadays or both like that. They yeah, increase. Whatever the education, everybody join this group. So I think the similar, why many people can uh, become interesting with the taxi driver nowadays? when it is supported by the technology. The technology can sustain or make a little bit, a little bit higher guarantee that the income better. So the things also, I think, I'm sure it will become dissimilar with the farming. When the farming could be supported by the technology, that's the, the production Product production of the farmer can guarantee it's enough for the living daily life. Maybe the younger people will join it. So that's why one the idea I'm interested from developing the technology. It is uh, the the drone spraying and then monitoring is one of the tools that we are developing now. Of course, also we also develop the precision farming such that the farmer can communicate it to the the plant, make the make it precision for the everything related to the farm. Also, can estimate it, the productivity as well using artificial intelligence or with kind of machine learning things. Information can be gathering and then collected and available in our smartphone. So when it is uh, exists and then can be validated well thing and that can be applied in the in the society. I'm I'm sure even I myself will become interested to become a farmer after finish my work in the office, then I will do farming as well. Because it has become such kind of not using the power of my body but using this kind of thing and then but everything become faster formation can be collected and then i can do the decision with with complete information from the the farm, the, the farm like that so i think it is the main reason i'm sure the other things also developing the technology also do the same reason because of i think in many areas the supporting technology will be can increase of the rest of many people to this kind of things. 
So I think this is my explanation. Hopefully, it suited to yeah the question of Mr. Egra from Java. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Parjun. Pasat Egra, clear enough the thank explanation you. and the answer from Parjun. Thank you very much for your explanation. Okay, well, uh, is there still any question? Okay, raise up your hand if you want to ask question and turn on your microphone. Okay, it seems that no more question, yeah. So uh, I think that uh, we will have to continue uh, with the second session of keynote speakers. And uh, for the second session, we will have Associate Professor Kose Yamauchi, PhD. Uh, Christopher P. A. Bennett, and then uh, Rasis Putra Ritonga, PhD. Well, uh, for the first session, uh, for the first keynote speakers, uh, the second session, uh, we have Associate Professor Kose Yamauchi, PhD. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Uh, how are you, Pak uh, Kose Yamauchi? Yeah, good, good. Thank you very much. Okay, good. So let me read your CV first, yeah. Okay, Associate Professor Kosei Yamauchi, date of birth, 1986-1221, education, 2006-2010, Faculty of Applied Biological Science at Gibi University, BA Applied Biological Sciences, 2010 until 2012, Faculty of Applied Biological Science, Gibi University, MA Applied Biological Sciences, and then 2012 until 2015, United Graduate School of Agricultural Science, Gifu University, PhD Agriculture, Dissertation Mechanism of Controlling Melanin Biosynthesis by the Constituents of Tropical Medical Medicinal Plants, and then Work Experience 2014 until 2015 with Japan Society for the Promotion of Science with the Research Fellow for Young Scientists, DC2, Gifu University, and then 2015 until 2016. Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, Research Fellow for Young Scientists, PDG Fu University, and then 2016 until 2017, the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, Overseas Research Fellow, Texas A&M University, and then 2017 until 2023, Assistant Professor uh, at Gifu University, and then to, uh, 2023 until present. Associate Professor at Gifu University. And the latest publication, the first one, uh, 2023 Potential of Prospective Medicinal Plants of Rizophoraceae from North Kalimantan, Indonesia, uh, Biodiversitas Journal of Biological Diversity. And then next uh, publication, Focus on Protein Aggregation, a model to explain the bioactivity of condensed uh, tinnins, uh, food chemistry, 2023, and then the last uh, about Garcidepsidon B from Garcinia parvifolia, antimicrobial uh, anti anti activities of the medicinal plants from North Kalimantan against dental caries and periodontal disease pathogen, medicinal chemistry research in press. Okay, Associate Professor Kosei Yamauchi, can we start the presentation? Well, thank you very much for okay. the introduction, Mr. Chairman. Um, Saya Yamauchi, Dari Universitas Gifu B, Japan. Saya suka sate. Saya suda sering ke Indonesia. Okay. Tapi <laughs> saya berum berunaha ke. Tarakan dan saya ingin ingin kian sana. Okay. Egulah datang ke Universitas Gifu di Japan dari Universitas Borneo Tarakan. Terima kasih 
Banyak atas kesempatan hari ini. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to make presentation. My study area is a natural product chemistry. I'm using very variable medicinal plants. There are some natural products that have the risk of extinction. So the environment of the earth is very important during this study. Today, today I will introduce you one of our study about bioactive natural products and searching the mechanism of the activity. You know, living environment is important for human health. Also, searching the bioactive compound is important for human health. Firstly, I will introduce our laboratory study. We found some compounds from Indonesian medicinal plant that improve human health. We have elastic active compound used for cosmetics, nerve stimulant, anti-obesity, anti-osteoporosis drug, and dementia improving drug. Today, I will show you the new right out of growth promoting effect of natural product and utilization. In this study, we investigated Glands of Paradise, GOP, the seed of Genia pepper, a ginger plant native to West Africa. GOP has long been used as spice and folk medicine in West Africa, and its bioactive functions have been reported in recent years. Previous studies have shown that GOP contains 14 vanilla compounds, 5 the heptanoid and the protocatechic proto acid. And the major compounds are the three vanilloid compounds shown here. <coughs> However, the vanilloid compounds have a strong pungency and water insolubility for applied research. So we attempt to solve this problem and expand the range of the applied research by glucose ratio. We generated three main GOP compounds from GOP powder by extraction, sequential extraction, and various types of calm chromatography, and attempt to glucosylation using phase transfer catalysis obtained a total of the four vanilla glycoside, including byproducts. As a result, we succeed in reducing pungency and obtain the water solubility and decide to investigate the differences in uh, phosphorosy functions between agricons and uh, glucose, glucoside. First, a brief description of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease accounts for 60 to 70 percent of all dementias and is the most common form of the dementia, affecting approximately 46 million people worldwide. The symptoms of the Alzheimer's disease start out as a slight uh, forgetfulness and then gradually become more severe. The disease is crossed into stages according to the progression of Alzheimer's disease. The initial symptoms, such as forgetfulness, Sleep disturbance are uh, followed by uh, the need to be aware of the wants, surroundings, starting steps during the late night wandering, intellectual disability, obvious brain atrophy, and eventually bed riding state. The currently available Alzheimer drugs are considered to be in fact in effect in second and third stages of the disease. And the treatment in early stages of Alzheimer's disease is considered important. The following is a brief explanation of the cause of the disease symptoms. Since it has been reported that GOP extract and the major compound have shown the neuroprotective and the memory improving effect, we decide to investigate their effect on neural or degenerative disease. In particular, this study focused on Alzheimer's disease, which is one of the most common neurodegenerative disease. 
They account for about 70% of all dementias and they develop with aging, as I mentioned before. It causes a variety of the symptoms due to the failure of information transformation between nerve cells. The disease is caused by the wide variety of the causes, especially inhibition of neurons and hippocampus, which is a risk are responsible for memory and the death of uh, damage of the neurons. In this study, we decided to investigate the effect of vanilloid compounds and their glycoside on the function of known growth factor, NGM, which is deeply involved in the differentiation and the survival of the neurons. The objective of this study are uh, summarized as follows. First, we investigate the effect of major GOP compounds and their glycoside on new right of the growth and explore the mechanism of the action of the 6 paradox and its glycoside, which are most effective on new right of the growth from an in vitro perspective. <laughs> First, I will show you the in vitro study. I will show you the screening of the new right elongation effect of the major compounds and each glucoside. Cells were seeded in 96 vertebrate and their shape were observed 72 hours after the addition of the sample. The cells in the control cells were rounded in shape, whereas the cells in NGF supplemented cells, cells showed the new right of growth. This time, the results for each vanilloid compound and the glucoside are, are the ones added with the NGF 5 nanogram per milliliter. The results for 6 genial, 6 sugar, and their glucoside. The result of 6 genial, sugar, and their glucoside showed a slight promotion effect on the elongation of the new right. Next are the results for 6 paradol, 5 metricity, 6, 6 general, and their glucoside. It can be seen that the glucoside have a more pungent effect on the elongation of the new right than the previous right. In addition, from the result of 8 different experiments, it is clear that the glucoside retain their new right promoting activity, although the activity is lower than that of agricons. In order to uh, evaluate the extent to which 6P and 6PG exhibit neurite promoting activity, we calculate the percentage of the neurite elongation positive cells and the average length of the cells that show the neurite elongation under each condition and found that percentage of positive cells increase significantly and the cell length increase with the addition of the 6P and 6PG. The activity of each compound at 200 micromolar showed an 8.7-fold increase in the percentage of positive cells for 6P, a 5.4-fold increase for 6PG and 1.8 and 1.44-fold increase in cell length compared to the result for NGF 5 nanogram per milliliter alone. The 200 micromolar dose of 6P showed the effect equivalent to that of the positive control, indicating that the effect of 6P on new right elongation is a constant relation dependent. To investigate whether the binding of NGF to plug A is required for 6P and 6PG to elongate the new light, we performed a similar experiment using K252A, an inhibitor of the TRKA uh, receptor, and found that novelty, which acted which act activate the pathway different from the NGF signaling pathway, hardly reduce the activity of the TRKA. In contrast, 
6p and 6pg decrease both percentage of positive cells and cell lanes. Nurse, 6p and 6pg exhibited the elongation effect related late to the energy of drug signaling pathway. We focused on the main mechanism of the new right out growth, real energy of drug pathway and investigated the phosphorylation level of ERK and ECRL, which are proteins on the main pathway and are activated by phosphorylation. Samples were added for 24 hours after cell seeding. Cellulizes were obtained at each time point, and Western protein was performed after various treatments. The results show that the activation level of both proteins were enhanced one hour after the addition of the sample. And the activation level of ERK and CREB grave returned to normal by 12 and 3 hours, respectively, suggesting that 6P and 6PD had no effect on the activation time for each protein. Therefore, we focused on the intercellular influx of calcium ions as a different pathway. Calcium ion is one of the factors deeply involved in change in the cell shape, and there is a mechanism to promote new adult growth associated with the intercellular influx. Furthermore, it is known that the binding of IMGF and the track A is involved in the transport of calcium ion and promotes the plasma membrane transport of the TRPV1 receptor, which are receptor for binary compounds. Since the compounds used in this study are also binary compounds, we decide to investigate the amount of calcium ion influx on addition of 6P or 6PG using two or four apparent chemogenic regions. PC12 cells were treated with 5 nanogram per milliliter of NGF and calcium fluorescent regions and the change in the fluorescent intensity were measured immediately after addition of the samples. Moving on the result. The vertical axis shows the percentage of fluorescence intensity in each measurement with the fluorescence intensity at the start of the measure, measurement set to 100. And the horizontal axis shows the time after the addition of the samples. No change in fluorescence intensity was observed in DMSO control or NGF alone. However, the amount of intercellular calcium ion increased markedly at 85 seconds after the addition of 6P and a return to normal at 220 seconds. On the other hand, the addition of 6PG and NGF didn't change fluorescence intensity in the control. These results suggested that 6P may exhibit neurite outgrowth via intercellular influx on calcium ions. Whereas 6PZ doesn't exhibit calcium ion influx. To investigate whether the intercellular influx of calcium ion is mediated by TRPV1, we used CPZ, an antagonist of TRPV1. We use the CPZ to investigate the change, change in the percentage of 6P and 6PG outgrowth positive cells and calcium ion influx in the presence of CPZ. Let us look at the new right elongation positive cell light. The positive cell light, cell light rate didn't change when only energy F was added. However, the rate decreased significantly in the presence of 6P and 6PG in the presence of CPZ. 
the increase of the fluorescent intensity of intercellular calcium ion was found to be reduced in the presence of CPZ. This suggested that the new right out of growth activity of 6P and 6PZ is action involved in binding to TRPV1. On the other hand, 6PZ showed new right out of growth elongation similar to that of 6P and its activity was reduced by TRPV1 inhibition. While it didn't show the intercellular influx of calcium ions, suggesting that it may be deglucosylated during the culture and act as a 6P. Therefore, after 0, 24, 48, and 72 hours of the sample addition, the culture medium was extracted with the methanol and subject to HPLC analysis to confirm the component in the medium. From the top, are the results for the pure DMAM, 6P and 6PZ. The middle is a 6P and NGF, and the bottom is the HPLC spectrum for the addition of 6PZ and NGF. The 6PZ results show the formulation of 6P in the medium, and the longer the incubation time, the longer the uh, peak size, suggesting that gradual deglucosylation is taking place. Furthermore, as you can see in the results for both 6P and 6PZ, a new peak spur was confirmed immediately behind each compound, indicating the formation of 6P prime from 6P and 6PZ prime from 6PZ. The sample was subject to LCMS analysis, and both 6P prime and 6PG prime were found to have a molecular weight of um, uh, minus 16 of the original compound, it is indicating that they are deoxygenated compounds. These results suggested that 6P or 6P prime produced from 6PG may exhibit the new right elongation activity exhibited by 6PZ. And it is unclear whether 6PZ itself has the activity. Summary of new right elongation mechanism. Although activation of the NGF drug signaling pathway is required for new right outgrowth activity of the 6P and 6PG, the major pathway, via phosphorylation of ERK and CLEB, is attributed to the action of NGF. On the other hand, 6P was found to exhibit a marked influx of calcium ion via TRPV1. And this calcium ion effects is thought to be linked to the new right out of growth effect. In addition, the binding of NGF and drug A is involved in the expression of TRPV1 on the plasma uh, membrane surface, supporting the results such as results that 6P and 6PG activity was involved in the binding between NGF and drug A. In addition, 6PG is deglucosylated to generate 6P, and the calcium ion result suggested that the deglucosylation 6P is likely to be involved in the activity. On the other hand, the formation of the deoxygenated compounds such as 6P prime and 6PG prime were also observed suggesting that these compounds may show the activity. Taking together, the above results suggested that new right algal growth observed in this study is due to the uh, synergenic effect. The acti activation of ARC and the CLEV by NGF and the intercellular influx of calcium ions associated with the TRPV1 activation by P6P. By We will briefly introduce the results of our investigation into whether 6P and 6PZ 
which have shown the remarkable right elongation in vitro uh, activate in more complex system in in vivo. Scopolamine is a drug widely used to create mice with Alzheimer-like memory impairment because it inhibited inhibit the function of the uh, glutenic neurons in the uh, hippocampus. The mice were bred under three uh, these conditions for one week, followed by one week period of the weight measurement and oral administration only, and then sequential behavior tests were conducted. The behavior tests were the elevated plus maze, the moist water maze, a novel object recognition test, and the wine maze test all conducted according, according to this schedule. We can investigate the working memory and the short or intermediate term memory using wine maze, the object recognition test, and the elevated plus maze. More smaller maze was used to investigate the long term memory. The elevated cross maze it's an investigation of learning and memory. Mice are placed at the end of the open arm and measure the time to enter the closed arm in the maze with open and the closed arm closed in, the, in this manner. We predicted that mice would recognize the presence of the closed arm on the first day of the test and then and that the time to enter the closed arm would decrease on the second day if the memory of the closed arm was retained. The time on, the, on day one for each group is shown here, and the time on day two is shown here. 6P and 6PG groups show the decreasing the trend in the time on day two. This suggested that 6P and 6PG tend to improve learning and memory. Next is the novel object recognition test. This is another test of learning and memory. On the first day, the mice are familiarized with the box. On the second day, objects of the same shape, size, and the colors are placed in the box and allowed to move freely. On the third days, one of the objects was hang to a new shape, and we measure the both the time spent showing the interested in new objects and the time spent showing the interested in original family objects. Because mice are usually more interested in a newer object, they spend more time on the new object if they remember the object of the second day. The time spent on the familiar object in each group is shown here, and the time spent on the new object is shown here. In both 6P and 6PG, the time shown, shown for the novel object is longer, suggesting improved learning and memory. There is a wine maze test. This is an investigation of a working memory and short time memory, which are involved in the early stage of a memory formation. Normally, the mice enter into the defined arm from the previous arm, as shown in the uh, like ABC, ABC. The number of varied entries is evaluated based on the number of valid entries to uh, the total number of arm entries. The evaluated rate was called the SA. In the memory impairment mice, the SA value is smaller because they tend to enter the same arm or repeat entering the same arm alternately. As you can see in the result of each group, the value tend to be improved by the administration of 6P and 6PG. This suggested an improve, improvement in the working memory and the short-time memory. 
Next is the moist water mail test. This one investigates the uh, spatial memory and the long time memory. First, the escape latency time was investigated. The pool is divided into four sections. Things are uh, Signs are placed and the mice swim around to the find a platform that is a safe zone. The time taken to reach the platform is ELP. We expected that the ELP would get a shorter each day as the mice memorialized the location of the platform. In addition, after four days of ELP testing, a probe test was conducted. We remove the platform and measure the time to swim in the area where the platform was located. Here are the results in both experiments. There was no improvement with the compound administration. In this behavior test, there was improvement in walking and short time memory, but no improvement in special, uh, spatial or long term memory. Dementia begins with the loss of short term memory capacity and gradually leads to the loss of the long term memory. Considering that this experiment was constructed, uh, conducted using the mice with Alzheimer like memory impairments. We believe that 6P and 6PZ are involved in early stage memory formation, suggesting that they may be involved in the present, uh, prevention of Alzheimer's disease. The two sites, Saja, Terimakasi, Banyak, Atas, Pahatian, Anda. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay, thank you, Associate Professor Kaseyo Mochi. Yeah, interesting presentation and really uh, difficult for us who different field, yeah, <laughs> to try to understand about the uh, research uh, from Associate Prof. Kaseyo Mochi. But for the participants with the same field, I think that it's really uh, good for you to have a new update about the research, yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, for the next, uh, we will continue with the second keynote speakers uh, from the second session. Uh, we will invite uh, Christopher P.A. Bennett. Hello. Christopher P.A. Bennett already joined Zoom. Okay, Mas Kiki or Mas Nofri, can you please check whether Pak Christopher Bennett already in? Mr. Christopher not in room right now. Okay, so uh, we will try to skip. Christopher P. A. Bennett first, and we move to Pak Rasis Putra Ritonga already in this Zoom. Hello, yep, good I'm here. Can, pa Rasis can you Putra? hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, so we jump to Pak Rasis Putra presentations. Yeah, for today, still waiting. Uh, related to Christopher P. A. Bennett with uh, technical problems, maybe. Okay. So before uh, Pak Rasis present. Uh, the paper or the research result. Yeah, let me read your CV first, Parasis. Okay, Parasis Putra Ritonga, PhD holder specializing in geomorphic hazards, particularly landslides using GIS and remote uh, sensing methods. Yeah, his academic journey equips him to mitigate these hazards using cutting edge technologies such as LIDAR. Uh, in recent years, yeah, he has focused on NGO-based research, managing greenhouse, gas emission, 
in the full sector and his role merged data science expertise with environmental challenges. A leading and supporting numerous international publication has been a primary aspect of his role within the organization. So let me read the education. Bachelor of Forestry, Forest Product Technology, IPB University, uh, changes in physical, mechanical, and acoustic properties of oil palm, trunks that have experienced mm -hmm. storage, and then Master of Science, Natural Resources, and Environmental Management, IPB University, research team evaluating the effect of topography and land use on landslide mobility mobilities caused by the Eastern Ibori earthquake of Hokkaido 2017 until 2019. And then Master of Agriculture, International Environmental and Agricultural Science, double degree program, yeah, from Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology 2017 until 2019. And the last, a PhD in Symbiotic Science of Environment and Natural Resources. Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology 2019 until present yeah and then the research assistant and United Graduate School of Agriculture Agricultural Science Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology from March uh, 2022 until present responsible to compile database for global land uh, cover maps and earthquake included landslide landslides yeah Examine the relationship between the different lens covers and the occurrence of earthquake induced landslide from uh, nine, 19th uh, uh, until present, yeah, using this analysis. And the latest project with Japan Indonesia International Forest Talks 2022 with Tokyo University Agriculture and Technology, Embassy of the Republic of Indonesia, organized a dialogue involving academics forestry business sectors and ministry of environment and forestry indonesia as a project leader and then the latest grants awards yeah tonen international scholarship foundation awardee tonen international scholarship foundation receiving daily allowance and international conferences and research funding the scholarship is owned by ineos holdings incorporation and then the latest organization experience midori indonesia forestry student and alumni association in japan Project manager of even division responsible to forestry attached in Japan for coordinating international dialogue involving academia, government, trader, and industry between Japan and Indonesia. Well, Parasis Putra, are you ready to present your material today? Ah, uh, yep, yep, I'm ready. So, okay. yeah, can I start? Okay. Um, yep, good morning. Uh, here from Bogor, uh, West Java. So I'm Rasis Putra Retonga, Natural Climate Solutions Data Manager of the yes, and Conservation Alam Nusantara, or probably previously you know my organization as YCAN, YECAN, or TNC, the Nature Conservancy. So, yep, uh, I'm really glad today because I also can see my professor, Prof. Dodi, yeah, because I studied in uh, Bukur Agriculture University, Faculty of Forestry, um, 10 years ago. <laughs> Uh, to pursue my undergraduate degree. So when I saw the first notification from the committee, the concept of the workshop is very unique, yeah. Um, linking human biodiversity natural resources on climate change. Then instantly I was thinking mangroves issues could be interesting because we are facing carbon loss and emission threats from mangroves that originally serve as ecosystem that protect biodiversity and aquatic habitat and place where human uh, life is dependent from its resources. So today, I'll make the share my screen. Okay. It is showing right now, right? Okay, can you see my screen now? Sorry. Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, so today I would like to include uh, our organization research related to mangroves in East Kalimantan, carbon stocks, and potential carbon loss rising from mangrove conversion to aquaculture in East Kalimantan, Indonesia. 
So as we know, mangroves are powerful allies in the fight against climate change due to their remarkable ability to sequester carbon dioxide, right? And the ecosystems store large amounts of carbon in their biomass and soil and serve as carbon sinks. Uh, the dense vegetation mangroves capture carbon through photosynthesis, and while the waterlogged condition inhibit the decomposition of the organic matter, uh, preventing the release of stored carbon into the atmosphere. So mangroves is very important to store our carbon and preventing uh, greenhouse gas emission release. However, in recent decade, uh, as you can see in the slide, mangroves in Indonesia facing threats of land use change uh, during two decades. Uh, here from 2009 to 2019, mostly to aquaculture, showing blue color, and also agriculture. So if we can see in East Kalimantan, it shows uh, dominantly in um, sorry, blue and also orange, right? So aquaculture and agriculture. I think in uh, surrounding Tarakan and North Kalimantan, mostly converted to aquaculture also. So uh, these two preferences has, have diff, uh, similar patterns. And yeah, and therefore we need to address this gap on what we can do to make things better so that we can achieve of climate commitments by 2030 because the mangrove laws can cause uh, increase in carbon emissions. So, uh, Asian Conservasi Alam Nusantara conducted a study called Natural Climate Solutions, or NCS. I'm not sure probably you often heard about NBS. Well, we call it NCS, uh, studied by us to assess potential emission mitigation in Indonesia to address the challenge mentioned previously. NCS was examined within three ecosystems. Here you can see drylands, peatlands, mangroves uh, of entire Indonesia archipelago. Then uh, we found total, sorry, before that, and also we assess the three scenario protection, restoration, and also effective management. So we found total NCS mitigation potential in Indonesia, uh, about 1.3 year gigaton CO2 uh, equivalent per year. So it is a double emission reduction target of Indonesia's NDC by 2030 from full sectors. So then we also got the results that wetlands have the greatest potential. Wetlands means pelons and also mangroves. Uh, accounting about 77% among 1.3 gigaton CO2 per year emission mitigation. Then, yep, wetlands is very important uh, for us to fulfilling our climate commitments. For mangroves in particular, despite low percentage here, mangroves have the greater mitigation potential density, about uh, 12 Megagram CO2 per hectare per year compared to drylands. So if we uh, conserve mangroves, then would, the impact would be greater compared to drylands in the same amount of area or size of the land. And yep. So therefore, deep dive into mangroves uh, potential is crucial to answer our uh, national climate target. Uh, we know previously mangroves has facing threats to aquaculture right? and assessing carbon balance due to this conversion is important when assessing mitigation potential. So this graph is schematic illustration how carbon balance due to land use change of mangroves converted to ponds. So this one in the mangrove and this when it converted to ponds or aquaculture. Uh, when mangroves exist here, uh, it can store a significant amount of carbon, right, to the mangrove ecosystem. 
and then indeed uh, it released the heterotropic crystallizations, or yep, we can imagine like photosynthesis. So uh, it's kind of a trade off effect, but the emissions lower than the absorbed uh, C or carbon. But when it converted to bonds, the the composition rate and also the CO2 release gas to the atmosphere will be greater compared to the carbon that can be stored in the or on the land. So uh it's really important to understand the schematic uh, illustration. And yeah, while previous study assessed national level emissions um factors from mangrove. This number is site specific as carbon loss magnitude might be different, just affecting decision makers to optimize land use practices. So we suggest uh, to assess this carbon balance, it is necessary to conduct site specific uh, carbon assessment. We take this gap to generate site specific emission factors for mangrove and cover change for our study. So the needs of assessing potential mitigation is strengthened by knowing NCS potential in is greater in Kalimantan here. Kalimantan, yep, this part. And we can see uh, by project restore manage, it also has significant amount of mitigation potential uh, yeah, after Sumatra. But for um, mitigation potential related to mangroves, we can see Kalimantan Timur. Uh, has the greatest mangrove restoration potential. So that's why we're really interested to uh, deep dive into the carbon emission factor in East Kalimantan, as they are also the implementer of FCPF. So the accurate emissions calculation is crucial in assessing mitigation potential. So the objective of this research to measure the carbon loss by assessing carbon stock in mangroves and shrimp pond and examine differences on fluxes of land use change from mangroves to pond. So we have to make uh, assessment, carbon stock, and also um, emission fluxes monitoring. Yeah. So we assess carbon stock from land use change from conducting carbon stock in mangroves and also aquaculture pond in Tabular Muarda, Berau, East Kalimantan. So here the culture, aquaculture on and this part mangroves. To examine emission dynamics, we use like our stress gas analyzer here, as you can see. So this tool can capture the emissions uh, released to the atmosphere uh, yeah, in both land covers. So we monitored during 2023, last year. So this is just schematic uh, plots that we installed. So here's the result for carbon stocks. In summary, mangroves has higher um, carbon stocks by about 18%. Because you can see here, uh, seven, about 700, more, almost 800 compared to 600. Um, well, it's interesting to see even though absence of vegetation in aquaponics, the carbon stored in the ground is still significant for aquaculture here, about 600. And yep, carbon loss estimated about uh, 900 uh, megaton CO2 per hectare due to land use change from mangrove to ponds. And this graph showing the total ecosystem carbon stocks above ground and below ground. Above ground show green, shows green, and below ground uh, is brown, light brown. Um, yeah, uh, aquaculture pond. Um, AP, short AP, and PMS, PMT, and SM is the mangroves itself. You can see the result in mangroves has higher ecosystem carbon stocks compared to aquaculture ponds. And the dominant tree then, uh, trees, or yep, there is Aficenia marina. So if you visit it, mangrove side, if you can see the root uh, appearing 
uh, stands like this. So it's Avicennia marina. And for monitoring greenhouse gas fluxes, we can see uh, this CO2 flux in mangrove forests got higher total greenhouse gas flux uh, within one year compared to aquaculture practice. This is kind of, of shocking, but not really because uh, we assume the aquaculture practice, carbon, sorry, carbon stocks, carbon contents in aquaculture practices already been gone by the pond embankment or yeah, because they need to dig the soil, right? Then the rich carbon that contains in the soil uh, extracted from the ground. That's why it's not really promoting the carbon emissions. Um, but we can see from May to October uh, for CO2 flux, yep, mangrove forest has higher uh, GHG fluxes. And we assume that tidal influences affect the rate of the emissions because if the seawater comes to for mangrove forest, then it will promote the sal higher salinity, where the salinity can trigger the microbial activities to, to produce CO2 more compared to uh, non-tidal um, area. So that's why tidal, tidal influx influences is very important to increase the CO2 flux during this period. And also because the tidal bring hot temperature from the ocean, it can also promote a higher CO2 flux uh, during this period. Because yeah, uh, hot temperature can uh, again trigger the microbial activities to be greater compared to the lower temperature. Other than that, uh, we also see the aquaculture pond prevent the fresh water from the upstream to reach the mangroves site, the coastal. Then yep, the salinity uh, cannot be lower because the fresh water cannot reach the mangroves. That's why the salinity and temperature is very important in understanding GHG fluxes in our site. So, so this is the second last uh, slide. So we already have the carbon stocks and also greenhouse gas fluxes. Based on this data, we can assess how much carbon loss from uh, East Kalimantan and also Brau uh, during a specific periods. So this assessment from 1990, to 90, sorry, to 2019. So in East Kalimantan, you can see overall uh, trends about 60% uh, converted to mang from mangrove to ponds. Uh, this conversion showing in lighter gray color, while the darker one uh, conversion to others, like uh, agriculture or something. And also in Brau, it's very interesting because we see from 2000 to 2019, the conversion from mangrove to pond uh, getting higher from 22% in about 90, 90s. But recently it becomes 60% of the 77,000 hectares. So recently, the trends of uh, conversing mangrove to ponds is very uh, significant in Brau. And yeah, that's also for the another city. Then we can see uh, what we can do if we know there is so many ponds. Uh, Several of them like inactive. So from this study, we can address the regional policy consideration on what kind of natural climate solutions 
activities that we can do or we can collaborate with regional provinces uh, government. So we can see in Kalimantan, uh, mostly we have active ponds here. So the ponds still uh, be utilized by the community and also yep, several stakeholders. But some of them also, we got inactive ponds like in Barao and also abundant one in Pasir Regency. So uh, there are several uh, activities that we can do. First, of course, restoration, but uh, they can promote secure initiatives. So we can apply 20% for aquaculture pond and 80% for restoration. So we, uh, based on this scheme, we can go uh, income for the community while we can also restoring the mangroves. Then we can uh, reduce the emissions. And also uh, know this carbon uh, project or carbon markets very uh, heated debate. So we can see the initiative of carbon incentives or FCPF, like in East Kalimantan, is very effective in promoting uh, or conserving the mangroves to be con converted to other land uses. So, yep, uh, we hope that um, this study can also give contribution to the provincial government what to do and how much uh, carbon emissions that we can save until 2030 based on this kind of study. So that's all from me. Uh, thank you, Odenodar. I will give it back to you. Okay, thank you, Parasis Ritonga, with uh, interesting uh, research uh, project results, yeah. And for the last keynote speaker, we will listen to the material from Christi uh, Christopher P. A. Bennett. Good afternoon, Christopher P. A. Bennett. Are already in the Zoom meeting? I am indeed. Thank you very much. Okay. So before you present the uh, material today, let me read your CV first, Christopher B. Bennett. Okay, Christopher Patrick Alexander Bennett is the Provincial Program Strategist for GGGI in Indonesia. Over the past 30 years, Chris Bennett has worked mostly in Indonesia, also in other Asian, African, and Central American countries on natural resource management and governance with a special focus on forestry and agroforestry. And his analytical work has covered the root causes of unsustainability uncertainty of tenure, under evaluation of natural resources and under regulation of negative neighborhood effects. His implementation programs have often centered on establishment of equitable spatial certainty that incentivize sustainability investments by smallholders, rural communities, and the private sectors in renewable natural resources. In such initiative, enable the poor harness their human, social, and knowledge assets for increased land productivity with positive downstream effects. One aspect of this work has been the successful promotion of inclusive landscape based approaches built on interinstitutional trust to replace exclusive and overly sectoral projects that are often plagued by uncoordinated behavior and divisive social jealousies underpinning this landscape-based initiative have been increased awareness that environmental management and economic growth are not two different choices, but rather mutually reinforcing. Playing a major role is mapping initiative for stakeholders through visualization of science and experience-based outcomes. Various scales, household, community, corporate, sub-landscape and landscape-wide comparing business as usual with optimal development pathways. And he also teaches university courses and works on impact evaluation analytics for policies and projects to improve aid effectiveness, aim at informing project implementers, beneficiaries, and designers, as well as policymakers. The metric of impact evaluation analytics emphasize outcome-based indicators 
that can be participatorily assessed comparisons with counterfactual sites share learning among stakeholders. Okay, Christopher P. A. Bennett, can you hear me? I can very clearly. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, please present the material for us. Yes, I will share screen. Let me just make sure that you can see my screen. Yes. Um, ah, having a bit of a problem. Just a moment, please. Yeah. You have a copy of my presentation, I think. Yes, yeah. I think we may have to go with that uh, because I am having some difficulty <laughs> sharing. Already my on screen, Christopher, already. Is it now? Okay, well, for some reason, I can't see that. Um, okay, uh, no can, 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 can everybody else see my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, in that case, um, when I say uh, next, then uh, please, I, I would ask you to uh, obviously um, move on. Okay, to, the operator to, will help you. Thank you very much. So I need to uh, access a different file. Okay, yeah. very good. Um, so uh, obviously the first slide. Thank you all very much uh, for this opportunity, especially to the organizers from the University of Borneo Tarakan. Uh, really excited about participating in this uh, conference on behalf of GGI and our office uh, in uh, North Kalimantan. Uh, I will present in uh, Bahasa Inggris, in English. Should anybody want to ask me a question later in Bahasa, I can respond in Bahasa. Basically, the idea of this presentation is to share with you uh, a paradox, a conundrum, a puzzle, why is it that local knowledge, ka'arifan lokal, or local wisdom or indigenous knowledge that is recognized by the government of Indonesia in the five-year national development plan 2020 to 2024, how come in actual practice it is not uh, being realized uh, optimally? And therefore, this local knowledge is, we consider, an undervalued asset for the land and the sea and the management of those landscapes, that they be sustainable. Uh, and then perhaps afterwards we can discuss why this is the case, but I will begin by showing you some examples of the value of local knowledge. Let me emphasize that we mean here local knowledge which complements saling lengkapi, saling menunjang, which complements scientific and modern knowledge that work together to produce more appropriate more harmonious, to borrow an expression from uh, the conference, uh, approach to sustainability. So then next slide, the map from Indonesia. The What I'm gonna share with you is a summary of the work that uh, I and my colleagues have been involved in across Indonesia from Sabang in Aceh to Meroke in, in Papua. And everywhere we go, we have uh, identified uh, myself and my Indonesian research colleagues uh, the value of local knowledge. And what underpins this idea is that if we are going to have ecological harmony, as you uh, put as a main theme of this conference, we have also to have an integration between the ecology and the economy. And please bear in mind, everybody, that the two words, economy and ecology, come from the root word oikos in the Greek, which means the household which implies that everything uh, related to both of those fields is somehow connected, the household or the globe. And where these two uh, work together, and in many cases, economic development and environmental development or natural resource development can and should work together and synergize, we get green prosperity. The degree of overlap will depend, of course, on the circumstances. So we were looking at the slide here, which was human nature and connectivity. I'd like to move on to the next slide now, please. And that slide is uh, showing you an example of this. It's the metaphor for sustainable landscapes, whereby if we look in the center of the picture, you will see that there is a micro hydro renewable energy generating installation in Morang in Jambi. And uh, what we found, what we find here is something that is very much uh, in the awareness of local communities. That's the connection between different sectors. And sometimes in universities, between ministries, 
uh, and uh, in uh, between other institutions, we fail to see this connection between uh, different sectors. And that's one of the features of local knowledge is that local people have generally a keen awareness of connectivity. So in this case, the micro hydro, which of course falls under ESDM, the Ministry of Energy, which is an energy issue, is fundamentally dependent on the watershed, the Daira Aliran Sungai, which feeds the water into the hydro. And unless we keep the forest cover in the DAS, in this case about 2,000 hectares, we will not have enough uh, water during the dry season nor uh, or too much water during the rainy season. And in this particular village, the village of Muara Madras, we found that once we installed the micro hydro, the local people shifted, Ali Fungsi, they shifted their, their interest in the forest from being illegal loggers to protecting the forest because they valued the electricity more than the illegal logging. Another example uh, in the next slide, please, planted village forest and downstream agriculture. And this is in Krui in, uh, in Lombok Barat in Western Lombok in the southern tip of Sumatra, where local people for the last 150,000 years have cultivated forests that look like rainforests. The forest in the background is totally planted and has been for over 150 uh, years. And this system depends upon the planting, the intercropping of different tree species of economic value, the damar, the clove, for example, are two uh, major ones, uh, the kamiri and, 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 and uh, nutmeg and so forth. But, but here we also see an awareness of local knowledge. They recognize here that this is not just value, for its in situ value, but also because of the downstream protection of water resources essential for the rice, the sour, the rice that you see in the foreground of this picture. And this is uh, an example of local knowledge. Let's move on to the next slide, please, which is the importance of balancing the different kinds of capital. And this is fundamental to understanding the role of local knowledge. Capital. Uh, and this framework was developed about 20 years ago, uh, basically is not just financial capital and the uh, physical assets, the roads, the bridges, the factories that are built with this. It is very important, but there are other kinds of, uh, of capital which are integrated with this, the natural capital, the natural assets, including biodiversity, the human capital, of course, which is uh, the labor, and the quality of that labor involved. And now as we come down, especially to the last two, we're dealing very much with local knowledge assets, local knowledge capital. That is social capital, which is about how you get trust uh, across sectors and you change behavior when you get that trust across sectors and the knowledge capital, the fundamental knowledge which we would argue needs to be integrated with science. So science can obtain ideas to research more deeply and to validate uh, what part of the knowledge capital from local people is of value or not. If we could go on to the next slide, please, which is three types of, of local knowledge. Fundamentally, we have exogenous and endogenous. Uh, and basically exogenous means that local people adapt the modern technology, be it renewable energy, be it forestry, agriculture, fisheries, you name it. They take the modern technology, which has been developed in research stations and universities, and they adapt it to their local conditions. And there are many, many examples of this, especially among small scale polyculture farming systems, but also large scale ones. Endogenous means something is discovered locally, independent independent of outside science. Perhaps one of the most famous ones is the discovery of a high yielding coffee variety called Marzuki in the 1980s and 1990s in Sumatra. Let's move on. And please give me, a, 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 if you would, a five minute warning when I must stop, because I will keep to the time that you have given me. The next one is about inclusive action. This is an example of where local knowledge and researchers are working or have been working extremely well. It's uh, work done by IPB at the Center for Human Resource uh, Development, and it's a rice intensification program 
uh, in the village of Kanigoro and other villages, but this is one village where uh, I and my colleagues uh, did some research. And we found there a tremendous collaboration between the researchers and also the, those who were um, the farmers and so on and so forth. And as a result of this, the researchers used local knowledge, local awareness of local conditions that the researchers did not have. And they, uh, they were able to figure out uh, the really great importance, the greater importance about the opportunity cost of labor, the fact that rice identification requires more labor, obviously, and the farmer's idea that we need an increased percentage of organic fertilizer, not just chemical fertilizer. Otherwise, the soil in that particular village they found would be degraded. And the researchers took this on and came up with even better recommendations. Let's go to the next slide, which is examples of uh, small scale farming agroforestry systems. Um, and it's just a range of examples. We will only have time to look at soil and water conservation and fire management and a bit on land use, use, uh, land use zonation, zonasi. But uh, basically there are many, many other examples. Let's look at some of those examples now. Let's look at rice. I mean, what do we see here? We all know, everybody knows what we're looking at here. Of course we are. We're looking at rice paddy fields or a sour. And, but basically uh, what we're seeing here is not only is water being managed, of course it is, and has been for hundreds of years, but also, also soil conservation is being managed too. And that's, you see in the plastic sheet over the uh, uh, inlet and outlet of water to reduce the erosion of this and some of you more closer to my age will realize that in the past before there was plastic farmers used to use banana stems which they would cut in half and therefore reduce uh, soil erosion. Uh, the work done at, at IPB uh, by agronomists is very exciting because they learned from the, from the they Everybody know, well, many people know that uh, rice is generally cultivated, at least in the past, in Java, using the Jajar Lago, as it's, it's called. We don't need to go into exactly what that was. But the researchers learned about a different pattern of rice planting called domino. And they used this to research it further. And it looks like dominoes. If you look at the, uh, the picture there, uh, it look, they look like dominoes, and that's the pattern of planting rice in the rice fields. And this increases rice yields 30 to 40 percent. And re researchers identified this, and then they refined it. So they took the local knowledge, this domino pattern, which was developed by a, a rice farmer, a single rice farmer, and they developed it further. So uh, a very good example there. Local knowledge. To the background, we see the same agroforestry system developed by local people, whether in private land or in state land. In the, in the distance, it's in state land. And basically, uh, this is an intercropping system of cloves, nutmegs, and that wonderful uh, tree, the durian. And this together produces forest cover that from the distance looks like natural forest. It has the same function or a similar function to natural forest. Uh, and it also, as well as having value in situ, ex situ downstream, of course, it protects the water resources. Uh, let's move on to the next slide in Papua, please. And this is perhaps the, the centerpiece and one of the most exciting discoveries. I wouldn't say we discovered this, but we rediscovered it. And this is a planting system in Papua. It's a terracing system, intercropping uh, tree crops to grow sweet potatoes, to grow sweet potatoes. And um, it's in Wamena at about 1,500 feet, very steep slopes, very steep slopes. Technically, according to the FAO and also Indonesian regulations, this is illegal because you're doing agriculture on, on overly steep slopes. However, this system, which we think has been going on for around about a thousand years, um, this system depends upon terracing terracing the very steep slopes with wooden trellises. You'll see that in the bottom left-hand corner. 
And then you'll see the slope where not only are the terraces there, but also the trees are planted, the chamara or the casuarina, which is pruned so that there's enough light reaching the sweet potatoes, but not too much exposure, which would leave it vulnerable to rain. And they feed the leaves of the chamara, the casuarina, to their livestock. And in so doing, there is no erosion on this slope. And if you, you may have to click again, but in the top left-hand corner, there's a picture of a waterway right at the base of this picture. Those are huts or honai. Next to the huts, you will see that the water here is crystal clear. And I took this photo after a very, very heavy rainfall. So no sediment was coming off this slope. Let's move on down to the next example. And uh, that is uh, in, uh, in North uh, Kalimantan. And this is a, a, a well-known uh, village. Yes, hello. Hello. No, just continue, Christopher. Okay, right. I'm sorry. Yeah. So basically, this is um, an area in private land, which is really exciting, where the local community, the Kenya Kayan people, have protected 330 hectares of natural forest in private land. They could all become super rich if they cut down these uh, trees. Look at this tree that you see there with the, um, the then sec uh, secretary of the village. That tree alone would fetch them between 20 and $30,000 net uh, at the time of sale. And they protected this land and this land has been recognized as protected by local government, the, the head of the region, uh, regency, the Bupati. Uh, we can see from Google Earth in the bottom left-hand corner that, brown, that dark green patch is where you see this forest. And they've done that for one reason and one reason only, and that is that they cherish the water resources. They cherish the water resources for the downstream village and for downstream agriculture. Shifting gear here in the next one, which is about fire, if you could go to the next slide, where land ownership is clear and secure. This is in West Kalimantan. People, when they set fire to this, this is mineral soil, not peatland when they set fire to the old rubber garden so that they can replant it with new high yielding varieties, they take great care to make sure the fire does not spread to their neighbors, does not spread to their neighbors. Uh, and you can see here where the fire was and it didn't spread any further because this farmer in the orange t-shirt had cleared the bush, cleared the vegetation to make sure the fire could not spread next door. If we carry on with the theme of fire, and you'll see a picture of an orangutan. This is in central Kalimantan, in the district of Pulang Pisau, where the fires have been so terrible, there are no more trees left in some areas, and orangutans are forced to live uh, on, on the land. Uh, let's, let's skip the next photo, is, which is more about the orangutan. But what's really exciting, I want to go to a map now. Please come down to the hotspot map, the hotspot map you see here. And this is in the same area that shows that when you have proper collaboration between local communities, local and national government, and the private sector, you can uh, result in um, an approach to managing fire, which is sustainable. So in the Desa, Desa Garung, which means Garung village, Garung village, everybody agreed there that they had to block the canals that were draining the peat and making it too dry, too dry and therefore vulnerable to fire. And what happened was that where they did this, two years later, where we had a very uh, acute dry season, two years later, we found that the village which had agreed with government, with the private sector to block the canals had almost no fires. In fact, the only fires that it had came from the village to the north, I cannot mention its name, but anyway, uh, to the north, uh, that had not wanted to control fires, that had not wanted to block the canals. And there the fire damage was, was, was devastating, was devastating. Let's move on, uh, we're coming towards the end now. Uh, and also one other kind of local knowledge, which uh, is essential, is, is tapping into local knowledge. This is in Java, the next one is in Aceh, of local people about the spatial setting, about maps of rivers and uh, land use, for example. And what we have found is when GIS, Geographical Information Systems experts from the government work together with local people, they can improve their maps. And if you improve the maps, the official maps, you make it easier to collaborate between the private sector, local people and government. 
And the same sort of thing has gone on in, in Aceh, which is the next slide. This is a women's group uh, in Aceh who are helping to refine the maps. You'll see down below, they're working with the GIS specialist to correct the maps. And something we find too is that when this local knowledge is used, the amount of land that the village asks for its own use is very small. This, this dark green is the national park of Loisa, of Gunung Loisa, Loisa Mountain. And in yellow and other shades, you see the area that the villagers have asked be assigned to them from agroforest. A modest request, and agroforestry is a good buffer, as we saw in the upper picture, a good buffer for rainforests in general. And then uh, finally, uh, before, I, before I close with a, with a closing thought, and this brings us closer to home. This is in East Kalimantan, but it could be in North Kalimantan. And it shows, uh, of course, a familiar scene for those of you in mangrove, certainly for those of you who attended the previous presentation on mangroves, and you see an effort to plant the mangroves. But the trouble is that when you get top-down planting of mangroves, you sometimes don't get an appreciation of the wider landscape and seascape. In this case, the local people uh, were able to, uh, to persuade uh, the DINAS, the service agency, of the importance to see the challenge of planting in a landscape seascape perspective, and the fact that we need to work across sectors. So mangrove is obviously about reestablishing a mangrove forest, but it's very closely related to fisheries. And in the distance of the photo, I'm sorry I can't indicate it with my, with my, with my uh, cursor, but you'll see in the far distance, there is a structure, it's a fishing structure. And that fishing structure is made of mangroves and harvesting mangroves to make that fishing structure undermines the mangrove ecosystem. And as the managers of this planting were able ultimately to persuade the fishermen, if you destroy the mangroves, you will destroy the source of your fish and you will suffer too. And the result was that the social capital between the fishermen and between the local villagers meant that they were able to come to an understanding whereby the fishermen were more careful about where they took the timber for the fishing trap and uh, had a silvicultural system for extracting mangroves that were sustainable. I want to end, if I may, and thank you for allowing me to get this far, Look at the last slide. Well, the last slide before I say Tri Makasi, it's on knowing. And uh, this, is, this is really uh, an invocation, a request that we all think hard about what we know and what we don't know when it comes to, well, anything really, but certainly when it comes to the role of local knowledge. And this was written by Nasser ad Tusi 800 years ago, a philosopher ma uh, mathematician from the Middle East. And he said, anyone who knows and knows that he knows makes the steed of his intelligence leap over the vault of heaven. Well, I, do, I certainly don't uh, include myself in, in that category. I think few people could. Hopefully we all fit into the second category. And here it is. Anyone who knows, who, who sorry, I beg your pardon, I start again. Anyone who does not know, but knows that he does not know can bring his lame little donkey to the destination nonetheless. And here is what all over the world, all over the world, certainly not Indonesia, but everywhere, we need to be aware of uh, when it comes to what we need to be aware of. In this particular case, of course, it's awareness of the value of local knowledge. Anyone who does not know and does not know that he does not know is stuck forever in double ignorance. And with that, uh, thank you very much for allowing me to go on without stopping me. And I'd like to say terima kasih banyak and uh, hand uh, the pen back to uh, you um, uh, in Tarakan. Okay, thank you, Christopher P. A. Bennett, for valuable materials today. Well, ladies and gentlemen, for the second session, keynote speakers, yeah, we already uh, completed three keynote speakers for the first. Uh, Associate Professor Kosei Emoji with the uh, junior paper and its effects on long and short memory and also about the controlling Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. And then uh, the second one, Pak uh, Rasis Putra Ritonga with the focus research with uh, carbon stocks and potential carbon loss. 
in mangroves and stream ponds. And then the last one with uh, Christopher Bennett about local knowledge, yeah, and undervalue asset for sustainable landscape and seascapes. Okay, now we move to the question and answer session for the second session of keynote speakers. If you have questions, please raise up your hand and uh, turn on the microphone and just choose we, uh, the question will be delivered to which presenters or keynote speakers. Okay, Christopher, thank you for your meaningful quotes. <laughs> okay, next, if you have question, also you can drop your question in the chat box. So I will read the question for you. Okay, Oki Talita, raise up hand. Okay, good afternoon, Oki Talita. Okay. Good afternoon. Yes. Uh, the question will be delivered to Christopher. Cause, uh, um, prof, uh, cause associate prof Kose Yamuchi or uh, Pak Rasis Putra Ritonga? Uh, the question is for Yamauchi Sensei. Okay, for associate professor uh, Kose Yamauchi. Okay. Okay, so uh, firstly, thank you for the opportunity and also before, thank you for the great presentation of all the all of the speakers and uh, Firstly, I'm so impressed with the uh, openings and also the ending of the speakers from other country, but they said it in Indonesia, so they say it very clear. And uh, my question to Yamati Sensei, uh, I think uh, your research is so great and as a student, uh, it's like a really complex apps. And I'm curious, why do you use uh, the male mice to do the behavior behavioral test? And will there be um, a different result if we choose if we use the female mice to do the behavioral test? That is my question. Thank okay. you. It's about um, uh, it's about sample selection, yeah. The question. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, Associate Professor Kosayomuchi, uh, clear enough the question. Uh, sorry, the, uh, there is some noise, so I couldn't catch your question. Please. Okay, the question is about uh, why why did you choose the male mice? Why not female mice? It's about the sample uh -huh. selection. Okay. Okay, so usually we use a male mouse because uh, if we use a female mouse, uh, the hormone is uh, different and the behavior is will be changed it's not stable compared to compared with the male mouse so usually we use a male mouse for uh doing the animal test okay so uh clear enough okay talita the yes, answer from yeah okay is there any question to christopher bennett or to parasis putra ritonga about the um, research result uh, one more question for oh, Yamaji okay. Sensei. Okay. Um, what is the biggest struggle or the hardest step uh, for this research? The hardest one? Mm -hmm. uh, animal test is uh, uh, actually uh, difficult because uh, we need to uh, treat uh, the animal every day. So this is, uh, if we doing our uh, behavior test, so we need to go uh, every time, every time, uh, every day, and to the laboratory, and then um, and uh, annual test is a little bit difficult to understand uh, and the effect because there are some uh, error because we use the uh, animal. It's not like uh, cells or protein. This is a difficult part for this experiment. Okay. okay, thank you very yeah. much. Okay. Yes, okay, thank you, Oki Talita, for the questions. And we still invite another participants. Okay, we have question here, Rasis Putra Ritonga. What is your opinion on how to convert mangrove land for pond aquaculture to increase fisheries productivity but not have a negative impact on carbon emission? Rasis? 
Yep. Uh, thanks. I think this is very great questions because this is related to our um, interventions or program in Yayasan Konservasi Alam Nusantara. Mm -hmm. So we have, as I mentioned before, we have initiative like Secure. Mm -hmm. So we, if there is a pond area, fish pond or stream pond, then 20% of the ponds will be located to the ponds and the rest, the remaining 80% will be restored to mangroves. So we are now conducting study to, what can I say, like to investigate if we reduce the ponds, then it will, it can, it is still, I'm gonna say the productivity is still high. So yep, there's some treatments in that uh, program, an ocean program, but yep, now we're still assessing that, then the remaining 80% of the restoration that we will restore will absorb the carbon emissions from the atmosphere, right? Then we got productivity and also we got the emission reductions, but it needs to be done by at the same time. So yeah, I think that's to increase the fisheries productivity uh, while reducing yeah. the impact of mount carbon. Yeah. Thank you, Parasis, for your answers. Hopefully that the questions are uh, clear enough. Uh, the explanation pro, uh, from Parasis Rizhonga, yeah. Okay, is there any question for the keynote speakers? We still have five minutes in this session, question and answer. Chairman, I have, uh, I have a question from Nure. Yeah. You can see it in your chat. Okay, chat. Okay, we, we, we have question. Is the testing of uh, the this bioactive from Genia paper which shows positive effects on long and short-term memory uh, still uh, being done on experimental animals or it has been tested on humans as an effort to control Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, uh, human trial has have not been possible because they require your collaboration with the physicians mm -hmm. and they are quite expensive. So it's a difficult to me to do the uh, uh, study using the human. And for, uh, for the animal testing of the GOP, uh, it has been completed and we are currently doing the animal test using the other samples. The, the study in, on the GOP is already published as a paper. Okay, hope that uh, the explanation from Kosei Yamuchi clear enough, yeah? Answering your questions in the chat box. Is there any questions for our keynote speakers today? Okay, I want to ask to okay. Mr. Christopher, in your opinion, is <clears throat> there any conflict between government policy and local knowledge from residents regarding land use? Please, uh, Christopher Bennett, answer this question. I see. Well, thank you, Diana, for that question, um, which might get me in trouble, but I don't think so. I, I actually, to be fair, uh, at a high level, at a high level, government policy is very supportive of local knowledge. It has been through the RPJMN, the National Development Plan for five years for the whole of Indonesia, identifies the role of local knowledge on a number of times. So at that very high level, it's there. Unfortunately, unfortunately, when it comes down to actually implementation on the ground, mm -hmm. it seems to get lost. That idea seems to get lost. We will see as we prepare for the next uh, national development plan for the next five years, 2025 to, to 2030, I suppose, we or 2024 rather, we, we will see uh, as we evaluate the past plan, 
whether the performance of local knowledge is mentioned or not. So again, at a very high level, yes, uh, the policy is there and very supportive. Uh, but uh, when it comes to, should we say, the mandate of uh, each um, development agency, even amongst researchers, there's, uh, there's a feeling, I think, that uh, this is really nice, but it's very costly and it's not really so valuable. There are more important things to do. I have to be honest with you that I'm not entirely sure why there is no translation from the high level policy to the low level. But I don't see any direct conflicts where the government is saying, do local knowledge, but don't do it in, in lower level policies. I've never identified that before. I think the principle is still accepted, but people don't realize the advantage. One quick final point. If you're a researcher and you work with local knowledge, trust me, you can find lots of uh, topics for researching and lots of opportunities for publishing in peer-reviewed journals about the value of local knowledge. And as we all know as researchers, uh, how many publications we have in big journals or important journals is very important. So I don't see the policy, but we certainly have, uh, Diana, we certainly have a lost opportunity. And hopefully in the further five years, uh, we will see this opportunity uh, more realized. Uh, but some institutions realize it, but policymakers don't at a low level. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Christopher Bennett, with the explanation about the questions. I hope that clear enough, yeah, answering your questions. Is there still any question or no more question? Okay, seems that that was the last questions for the keynote speakers. Well, thank you to all our <laughs> keynote speakers today and thank you for attending this conference. Yeah, and all the participants, if you still have questions, there are additional questions for our keynote speakers, mm -hmm. you can select the, uh, the persons in the participant list and send a private chat message here. Yeah? And thank you to all participants for your attention and also your participation during the conference. And Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Back to MC Asuna. Thank you very much, Dr. Waro. What an insightful session from all the speakers. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as the main season has just ended, we are now going to have a break. The parallel session will be started at uh, one thirty Central Indonesian times, or um, exactly thirty minutes from now. Please make sure you do not leave the meeting because the operator will take you to the breakout room anytime soon. So goodbye for now. We wish you all the very best and looking forward to meeting you again here at the closing ceremony where we will announce the best presenter from each breakout room, and we will also share the e-certificate link. Thank you. Thank you.
closing said, goodbye for now. We wish you all the very best. And to the break, 30 minutes from 30, have a break. The parallel session will be started at uh, 1.30 Central Indonesian times or um, exactly 30 minutes from now. Please make sure you do not leave the meeting because the operator will take you to the breakout room anytime soon. So closing goodbye said. for now. We goodbye wish for you all the very best. All the very best. best. The meeting the you again here. Three minutes from the the closing ceremony have a break. where we will announce the, the best session will be each breakout room. And we will also share the e-certificate link. Thank you. Thank you.